Yeah. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Big in Japan whiskey tasting. I'm Adrian, and joining me is uh, Hello, Chris Hennessy. Whoops, I'm going to turn that down. Um, so, yeah, so we're tasting some uh, really nice Japanese whiskeys, uh, going through a lot of uh, different areas and a lot of different ages, as well as uh, tasting some historical whiskeys also. Um, this is our second tasting. We've done one over on Instagram and not so well long ago uh, during the first lockdown. So this is our second attempt. Hopefully this one will be a little bit better than the last one. Um, we basically were, it took about six months to make this uh, tasting happen. So I'll start it kind of in November uh, when we were in between lockdowns and it was meant to happen in Left Bank. But unfortunately with the situation that it is now, we decided to move it online. So here we are. Um, thanks for everyone that uh, was willing to join us and either with or without the set. If you're here just for listening to information, make sure you tune in. There's going to be a lot of info that you might be interested in. If you have a tasting pack, then awesome. Um, you're going to enjoy them with us. Um, I'd like to thank Chris for joining us, obviously. And I'd also like to thank Victoria, who's behind the camera and making sure that everything is working very smoothly because I have two left hands when it comes to computers, as you can probably guess already in the previous tastings with uh, duct tapes and um, different stands and all that. So I'd rather stay away from that. I'd rather concentrate on the whiskey uh, side of things. So. As, you, as you know, I play to my, uh, my advantages and my, my strengths. Computers are not my strengths, and um, I'd rather stick with whiskey, to be honest with you. Um, so yeah, maybe... A, start off with a little bit of history and it comes to uh, Japanese whiskey industry. Um, it's completely different to what you would expect it with uh, any other uh, whiskey producing countries because uh, Japan wasn't really exposed to whiskey or, or alcohol production as such up until the late 19th century. And um, basically the first exposure that Japanese people had with whiskey, they maybe had some other encounters uh, here and there, but not to the general populations as such. As uh, so the first ever um, encounter with whiskey was in 1853 when Commodore Matthew Perry arrived to city of Edo, which is now Tokyo. And he arrived with a few ships and basically invited himself into the port, uh, wanted to establish a trade deal with Japan, which was at the time completely shut off and closed off to uh, all outside uh, influence. So much like North Korea is today, you can technically think of Japan back then in, in similar ways. And he was kind of the first uh, Westerner to arrive in Japan in those times. So it was a big, uh, a, a big thing happening in Japan at the time. And um, he wanted to establish a, a, a trade route between America and uh, Japan. Uh, Japanese uh, people really didn't want to be involved in that way because um, they were worried that the Western powers are going to overrule and overtake the country, uh, like it happened with the opium wars in China and Britain. So they wanted to avoid that as much as they could. So what they said was they they let him into the port because they knew that their defenses, uh, naval defenses, weren't strong enough in Edo at the time. So they said they're gonna play on time, invite him in, accept his letter from the president, and then give him an an answer when he'd be back the next time. He said he'd be back in a, in a year, but he tricked him as well because he knew that this is what might happen. So he instead of arriving a year. Later, he arrived six months later with double or even triple the amount of ships. So they had no uh, way of defending themselves once again. So they had no choice but signing the treaty and open into the West. Uh, after that, more powers came over and decided, started to set up their own little ports uh, that were really unfavorable to the Japanese people. And the shogunate, which was at the time under power in Japan, uh, had loads of issues with that. And there was some... Uh, feuds and disputes within internally in the country. So uh, the shogunate ceased to uh, have the major power in Japan in 1868. And after that, the Meiji period started where it was a big industrialization and um, there's big industrialization and um, 
a lot of uh, different uh, techniques and Western industries were coming into the country, uh, trying to basically modernize the country that was closed off uh, from outside influence for about two, three hundred years. So they are way behind with uh, all different new techniques that are coming out from Europe. So they weren't exposed to uh, machinery, heavy machinery that you'd see in Europe. Uh, they weren't exposed to new ways of produ producing things and such. And so that's what that was the first time they've uh, they've experienced whiskey. Uh, apparently, it was some American rye and some Scotch. About seventy to hundred gallons arrived. Uh, some of it was meant to go to the emperor. Apparently, he never did make it to the emperor. Probably got missing on the way. Don't blame him, to be honest. Um, in 1871, they started issuing first alcohol licenses along with soy sauce licenses. So it was like a double license. We could produce alcohol and soy sauce really weird. Apparently you can produce alcohol out of soy sauce, so maybe that's why. Um, they Basically, there wasn't many rules as regarding to the types of liquor that you could produce because the techniques weren't still there. Uh, they were, at the time, they are really producing local wines from fruit and such, so there wasn't really high ABV alcohol present at the time. Uh, when the Magi period started, there's a lot of different... Um, technicians coming into the country uh, with regards to alcohol industry they've managed to get about 63 different individuals from six different countries varying from different alcohol industries obviously like beer wine spirit making all that stuff uh, arriving into the country and teaching Japanese producers how to make alcohol properly with new Western methods and new Western uh, techniques and machinery so We've seen starting the modernization period from by 1870s onwards. Um, the alcohol production, uh, such as high ABV alcohol production, wasn't viable until early 1900s with the arrival of uh, continuous stills from Germany and France. And that's when it started to become viable to actually make uh, high ABV alcohol then. Back then, it wasn't really used for drinking it was mostly used for gunpowder production as chris you mentioned in the last tasting has uh, been quite widely used in, uh, in gunpowder production and pharmaceuticals also as a solvent um, after that um, since the new methods arrived the continuous still in particular start arriving they start producing uh, neutral alcohol or grain alcohol from different uh, things that they had in hand uh, very commonly was uh, like making alcohol to sweet potatoes um, or any other fruits like starchy uh, vegetables that they had in hand in Japan. So that's what you'd see most of the time. In regards to whiskey, they really try to just imitate what the Scottish and European producers were making. They weren't really making whiskey. It was usually a neutral grain alcohol and they were adding a lot of different things to change the color and change the flavor like tea leaves, wood chips, whatever they had in hand to try to imitate what whiskey actually was back then. Um, it wasn't until early 1920s when you've seen whiskey as whiskey starting to develop. So first person that we'll talk about in more detail later down the line is obviously Masataka Takatsuru, which was the first Japanese to uh, learn about whiskey production uh, from Japan. Um, and then you had Shinjiro Tori, which set up a Yamazaki distillery in 1923. And the first whiskey you're going to taste is going to be a Suntory. So um, Suntory started in 1899. Uh, by Shinjiro Tori. So he was a young pharmacist. He was an apprentice pharmacist. And he liked mixing things. And at that time, the pharmacies also carried alcohol. So he did experience with mixing alcohol, especially wines at the time, uh, as uh, any export wines that they would get from either Spain, France, or whatever, weren't really palatable for Japanese uh, consumers because they tended to prefer sweet wines. Whereas uh, wines from Spain or France weren't really that sweet. They were more bitter and more sour. Uh, like, for example, trying to compare port wine with regular wine. They are more used to kind of a sweeter style port wine rather than a regular uh, red wine. So he was plan, plan, planning a lot, a lot with uh, 
different wines and he was mixing a lot of different wines in the shop while he was uh, uh, apprenticing there and then decided to open his own shop and at the time he was selling canned food and then some wines and he met a guy from Spain that was living in uh, in Kobe at the time uh, by the name of Sayes and he showed him world of Spanish wines and he he loved the wines but the consumers didn't and he had a problem of actually shifting them from the shop so what he decided was after visiting him a few times, he tried the port wine for the first time and he really liked it and he thought that Japanese consumers would really like it too. Um, so he decided to start um, mixing Spanish wines that didn't sell, adding some sweetener, putting them in the bottle and selling it like that. And he was selling it as a Japanese port wine. Uh, very successful. Uh, his first attempt he wasn't really too happy with, but it sold out uh, very well. Uh, but he decided then to go on and do another blend and he called it the Akadama port wine which went on then to basically fund the whiskey operation that he was planning to open um, when uh, the Akadama port wine was successful and um, uh, the funds that he made out of the wine were put into the distillery and 1923 a, a building of the distillery started and uh, it he chose the location of Yamazaki, which is it was was at the time a small village, right bang on in between uh, Kyoto and Osaka, so two big cities. Uh, as I was saying, Masataka Takatsuru was involved with uh, Suntory at the time. He was the first Japanese person to know how to make whiskey properly from the Scots. Uh, so he was hired by Masataka in '23, and he had to design the distillery, and he had to run the distillery for the first few years. Um, they weren't very happy with the first runs of the distillery. Uh, by the way, the first uh, distillery run happened on the 11th November at 11, 11 a.m. So very specific, 11, 11, 11, 11 uh, on, in 1924. They weren't very happy with the first runs. They actually were furious, especially Tori was very furious with Takatsuro that he didn't get it right. Um, they didn't know what was wrong. And after the first season of distilling, uh, Tori sent back uh, Masataka to Scotland to figure out what was the problem and at the time he visits, uh, visited Hazelbourne Distillery which is closed down now, I think closed down in 25, not so long after Masataka came back uh, from Scotland and they said that the problems were very likely to his poor kilning or drying off the grains and bad control of the temperature of the distillation and that was because at the time they were using uh, coal fires they like direct coal fires under the stills so it's very hard to control the temperature and that was the biggest problem um, in 1929 they released their first whiskey which was called the shirofuda and shirofuda basically means white label and later on it was changed to white label it was a huge flop no one liked it they couldn't sell it it was too smoky too bitter uh, too born taste, it just didn't suit the Japanese palate. It's like trying to you get a new person that haven't tried whiskey and you put a, a, a peated island in front of them. It's it's not going to work essentially. So that's what exactly what happened. It just didn't work. Um, by that time, the relationship between Tori and Takitsuro was already strained enough. And in those times, the Tori or the, the Suntory company owned a brewery in Osaka, so he sent Takatsuru to look after that brewery, basically demoted him, and started pushing his son Kichitaro to take over the running of the distillery. He Masataka actually traveled with Kichitaro to uh, Scotland back again in 1931, so he get the ropes around uh, different Scottish distilleries and see how the production happens there. Unfortunately, he never got the chance. He died during the war. I don't know if he died in fighting or was it a different cause of death, but he died quite young and never actually uh, got into the distilling business at all, unfortunately. But over time, Masataka left in 1933, 1934, and Tori was left uh, to his own demise. Uh, he practiced a lot with trying to figure out how to make a perfect blend because this was he was interested in blending as such. And he was trying to concentrate on the blending part and did his best to try to blend uh, the whiskies that he had in hand uh, to make them palatable. Uh, he even slipped in 
whiskey sometimes to his friends and trying to see if his whiskey was good enough. So he had like three samples. One was like Johnny Black, one was his and something else. And always his whiskey wasn't the most favorable one. They really didn't like it at the time. In 1937, after Mass Attack left, uh, it was the first successful whiskey that they produced called the Kakubin, meaning the square bottle. It's still immensely popular today. Like you see Kakubin adverts pretty much everywhere along Nika Black adverts. They, it's the most popular whiskey in Japan at the moment, I would say, by a, by a big margin. Um, so that's when they start, the distillery start making successful. Uh, during the war, they had no problem shifting uh, their liquid at all because of the war and the army drank quite a lot of it. After the war, they had some struggles, obviously, with uh, securing uh, the amount of um, grains and different materials to make whiskey. Um, but um, after a while, when the economy started growing and expanding, they, they, they were able to secure more and more, and they were able to run the distillery at a higher capacity. After the war, he was actually made to sell whiskey to the American occupation forces, unfortunately. Uh, he hated it. He absolutely hated it. He, he had to, it was a hard pill to swallow for him. He was a big nationalist. He was selling whiskey to the Japanese army throughout the whole war. So obviously he wasn't too happy that now he has to sell it to the Americans. Uh, he made two types of whiskey for him, one for regular GIs, which is called the Blue Ribbon. A really cool bottle. It actually had a, a bottle cap, a regular bottle cap, rather than a, than a cork or a screw cap. And he made a very rare, oh, no, sorry, very old whiskey for the officers or the higher echelons of the American army. Um, after after the war, uh, they really concentrated on a low end market. They trying to grow their low end customer base at the time. Anyway, after the war, everyone was really poor. It was shortages of food, so people weren't really looking and buying really expensive whiskeys. And the whiskey law that was set up in 1943 initially was very interesting because it's for, for, that was the first time that it was um, mentioned as whiskey as such, how is it classified. So it's completely different to what you expect. They actually classed whiskeys into three categories at the time. So it was a first class whiskey, second class whiskey and a third class whiskey. Each class had a different uh, specification. So we start with the lowest, the third class. Uh, there was basically three main criteria. The ABV, the amount of real whiskey in whiskey, I know, right? Uh, and the tax bracket, essentially. So the third grade, lowest amount of real whiskey, lowest ABV, lowest tax bracket. Second, little more, little more, little more. And then the first class uh, was the most expensive and the, the, the most sought after, I suppose, and the most, definitely most expensive anyway. Uh, these rules and regulations changed slightly, so the nomenclature changed over time, so it wasn't called second, first, third class. It was then called special class, first class, and second class. Very fine changes in the amount of whiskey in the whiskey, and the ABVs changed slightly. The biggest change really happened in 1968, when it was the first time when when if you call in something whiskey, it had to have some sort of a whiskey in it. Up until then, uh, a third class or a second class later on called didn't have to have any whiskey at all. It could, it could, it has to, it had to have a maximum of five percent of malted whiskey in it in the blend. Rest could be absolutely anything. It could be blended alcohol, whatever you want. Pond water didn't matter. Uh, they could add anything they they wanted really. Um, after 1960, that changed the minimum requirement for the, the second class whiskey was 5% and it went up as far as 14%. So it had to be in between that bracket of the actual whiskey being in the bottle. Um, in 1989, uh, after long battles between the Japanese producers and uh, EC, especially or the EU right now, uh, American and Canadian producers, uh, really pushing the Japanese uh, authorities to change their rules and regulations because they felt that it was discriminative of their uh, brands for simple fact that no one in Scotland is making a second and a first grade whiskey that was under 5% of real whiskey in the bottle. No one was really making it. No one really made the effort to even attempt to make something like that. They wouldn't bother their time into 
going into an obscure market and trying to develop a product that would fit in the lower tax bracket. So after long pushes, I think it took over 10 years in, um, in deliberations with the GATT, which is now the WT wall, the World Trade Organization. And in 1989, they finally decided uh, to change the, the rules, abandon the whiskey classes, and basically put a standard cap of 10% of actual whiskey had to be in the bottle to call it whiskey. Didn't have to be made in Japan, didn't have to be aged in Japan, didn't even have to be bottled in Japan, as long as it was sell, sold in Japan and had Japanese whiskey on it, and minimum requirement was 10% of whiskey in the bottle, you could call it Japanese whiskey, essentially. So quite broad, I would say, quite broad. But yeah, uh, that's about to change when we were setting up the, the tasting on the 13th or the 16th of February, the rules actually completely changed. Um, I'm going to talk about the rule changes at the end at the, with the last whiskey, so I'm not going to say anything yet. Keep you on your toes, I suppose. Uh, but yeah, I'll talk a little bit maybe about the Yamazaki distillery. You can probably you can have a taste of the first one if you want, and I'll talk away about the distillery. Uh, so yeah, as I said, 1924 is first distillation. Uh, at the moment. The Yamazaki distillery has been updated kind of in the mid 80s. So it's more not the, the oldest still in there. I think it's from 1981 or 1989. Uh, so it's modern enough. Uh, everything about Yamazaki is about producing as many types of distillates and whiskies as they can possibly can under one roof. So they have uh, a lot of different fermentation tanks, both uh, stainless steel and wooden. They argued that uh, wooden uh, fermentation tanks uh, help to produce the lactic acid bacteria in the tanks and that affects the flavor of the end wash, which means that they can get a different kind of wash from a wooden vat and a stainless steel vat. So they use both because they want to have different variations. They use two types of yeast. They use distillers yeast and they use uh, a brewer's yeast as well. Distillers yeast more for a clean estuary wash and brewer's yeast for more creamy and cloudy wash. Um, they double distill always. And the way they have it set up is very interesting because they basically have room, whether it's the still room, where they have still sitting on the left hand side, they have wash stills, on the right hand side, they have spare stills. Every still, pretty much every pair of the stills, so basically they're set up like in pairs. So you have for one, two, three to eight. Yeah, that has to be chewy. Good idea. Move it slightly, yeah. Lovely. Um, so they, um, where was I? Stills. Uh, so each still is slightly different, different shapes, different sizes. Uh, the necks are different. Some have uh, constrictions on the necks, some don't. Some have uh, a big angle on the line arm, some don't. Some are directly heated, some, some aren't. Uh, so there is a lot of variations there. On top of that, they usually use them in pairs. So let's say wash still one is used with spirit still one, but they can also converge and switch them around as well. So for example, they can use wash still number one and pair it with uh, spirit still number six or number seven. And that way they give them another bit of variation. They have so much variation, in fact, that they can, they say they can produce about 70 dif different types of distillates under one roof. So you have the, the different initiation fermentation in yeast and probably mash bills as well. Uh, then you have different stills, and then moving on to maturation. So usually they use uh, six types of barrels. Uh, in 1934, uh, Tory really wanted his own cooperage, but he had a big problem again because he didn't have anyone qualified to be able to do uh, wooden barrels because it wasn't that common to do barrels. But what was common was making uh, wooden tubs. So it is a, a sealed container made out of wood. So he decided to contact a guy named, I'm really sorry, I'm going to butcher this name. Uh, by the way, I'm really sorry because I'm probably butchering a lot of names. Um, my Japanese is not that great. It used to be better. Um, by the name of Jinojo Tateyama, good attempt. 
Uh, we'll and, call it Geraldine. <laughs> yeah. And he was, he was a, a wooden top maker and basically had no idea how to make uh, barrels. He made tops and he was self-taught. Essentially what he done was he took the barrels, dismantled them, looked at the way the stairs were done and how the, the rings were put together and everything. And he basically learned from dismantling casts and putting them back together. And then he passed on his knowledge to his son and his son passed on knowledge to his son. And now the third generation of the Tateyama family is looking after the cooperage in Yamazaki. Really cool. Like, I mean, learning something off by just dismantling things and just figuring out things by yourself. Like that's, that's pretty hardcore, I have to say. Um, but yeah, anyway, maturation, they use about, uh, most of the time they use about six different types of casks. So they, uh, they use 480 liter punchins, which they make by themselves on site uh, from American white oak. They do oversized hogsheads, which are made from dismantled bourbon barrels and just put together into bigger size. I think they're about 230, 250 liter size. Uh, that the ones that they use, obviously ex bourbon barrels, since they're part of Beam Centauri now, obviously Jim Beam has given them shit tons that they have, don't have to really worry about the shortages of that anytime soon anyway. And they have also contacts with, well, they actually own a chateau in France called Chateau La Larane. Sorry, French people. Um, so they, they have access to really premium uh, hot medoc casks from Bordeaux. So they're really safe in that. They also make Umeshu. Uh, they sometimes use the Umeshu. I think they did a limited release uh, ex Umeshu aged whiskey. They actually released both. They had an Umeshu aged next whiskey and a whiskey aged next Umeshu. So they killed two birds with one stone. I think it was a limited release of 3,000 bottles. So if you can find one, give me a shout. I'd love to try it. Um, what else they use? Obviously, yeah, the sherry barrels, they, they're quite prevalent with their sherry barrels because the first barrel that they actually filled ever in the Yamazaki district was a sherry barrel uh, from Cadiz in Spain. Uh, still there on site. You can, if you ever visit the distillery, you can visit it uh, and you can see the barrel by yourself. I think it's empty at the time, but I think it was used up until the 80s. And then they use the Mizunara oak. Uh, Mizunara oak obviously is very famous for Japan. It's the Japanese water oak uh grown in the northern part of uh japan in the northern island of hokkaido very 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 hard to come by i would say that some irish producers would know what i'm talking about they produce about 300 casks a year uh due to the regulations that are put on the cutting down of the forests in hokkaido they want to preserve it as much as they can so the amount of trees that they cut down a year is very limited very low so there's about only 300 casks here being produced. 1% of that of overall casks that Centauri uses in Yamazaki is actually uh, Mizunara. So very, very little of it. But what Japanese producers say that water oak is, number one, very hard to work with. Number two, it's very porous. No, it's very much more porous than any other uh, oak type. Uh, but it gives a fantastic flavor. Uh, Japanese con the producers argued that a Mizunara oak is a, a longer aging barrel, so you do have to keep the juice in the barrel for much longer to get the desired effect. They say 20 years is the cap time, so it's quite long. Obviously, they were used for finishes, especially because we've seen it in, um, in, the Jap in the Irish whiskey side of it. Writer Steers had one, mm -hmm. and Glendalough had one. I haven't tasted them, so I couldn't tell you if they're nice or not. But I think you've tasted it. Right, Steers is fantastic. Glendlock's really nice. That one in two people seem to like the Glendlock. Nearly everyone likes the Very Steers. Nearly everyone yeah. likes the Brighter Steers. Yeah. I have to get a bottle actually. They were they were available in the airport, weren't they? Yeah, they had two different casts in the airport, and now there's one that's general release, so you should be able to pick them up. Oh, okay. The shops. Okay, very good. And um, so yeah, and um, the way they have it set up as well with maturation, they have three different maturation sites. So they have. Uh, much, obviously, they mature at the Amazaki, but they only mature about 15% there because of the fact that they're worried about uh, losing their stock, and I'll tell you why in a second. They have a second maturation site, in, which is called the Omi, and that's where the majority of the barrels are, and they have a third uh, maturation site at the second distillery called Hakshu, and they're using three sites, and they try to separate the liquid as much as they can between the three sites, and that's because of constant danger of natural disasters in Japan, obviously tsunamis, earthquakes, whatnot. 
what they do is they try to separate out. So if a natural decides that the disaster strikes at some point, they don't lose all the liquid. If the damage is Suntory uh, or the, the sorry, the Yamazaki distillery, they don't lose all of the stock that was produced there. So it's a precaution. Uh, all the barrels are always stored on their side there. In Yamazaki, they use a donage style um, uh, aging uh, facility. So it's just barrels stuck too high on top of each other and the wooden rail in between them just to keep them solid. And in the other two sides, they use a racking system made out of stainless steel. So it's very secure when it comes to earthquakes and they're a little bit higher, five or six uh, barrels high. Um, anything else I want to say now? I think that's all. I just have the names here. Yeah. No, I think we get into the whiskey. So this is made in early 1970s. And so Suntory Old started in, well, the first time it was announced was in 1940, but obviously that wasn't a really good time to release a premium whiskey because it was the middle of the war. So he, uh, Mr. Tory pushed it back to 1950, but the design of the, the label and the bottle stayed the same as it was in 1940. It was, Advertises the first premium whiskey in Japan. I don't know if that's the case. I couldn't find any other premium whiskeys that released at the time. And the first specs of this whiskey were very impressive. The, the liquid that was in it was between eight to 15 years old, all aged in sherry. Obviously, since it was a, it was classed as a special class whiskey, the minimum, amount, the minimum content for this had to be 27% of real whiskey in the bottle. I'd say it's a little bit more. Obviously, he could cut it down, but like I mean, if if you're presenting as a premium product, you really don't want to uh, dilute down your uh, your your premium whiskey with something inferior than that. And um, I know that I know that this is from early '70s because the name slightly changed. Uh, used to say instead of saying Suntory Limited, it used to say Kotobukiya, which was the previous name of the company, and it changed later to Suntory. Um, the up until 1971, uh, Suntory actually grew some of their own barley and malted their own barley and uh, was sourcing the barley from mainly from Japan because the import quotas on products outside of Europe was uh, quite high, so they weren't able to do that. It wasn't making financial sense. But after 1971, that changed, which means that uh, pretty much they stopped all the production of grain. They were just buying in bulk from UK. It was just much easier, much cheaper. And they, they scrapped all that after 1971. This is early 70s, so we'd say that if it's if it if it goes by the same rules as the first uh, very old Suntory, which was eight to fifteen years old, this was probably distilled in sometime in the 60s, which means that the the grain that was here uh, was likely Japanese, likely produced by Suntory, likely malted by Suntory uh, by their own hands. So this is probably one of the last runs of the whiskey that was made from pretty much start to finish by, by Suntory. And we know that it was coming out just from one distillery. They have three distilleries, but since it was an early 70s bottle, we know that this is made in Yamazaki only. It wasn't made in any of the other distilleries because they didn't exist at the time. So, um, anything else? Yeah, well, that's it. Let's taste. So, like you can, a lot of fusel oils, I think. Um, you can see a little bit of kind of like date sweetness. Yes, like um, I had a- Paper soap, um, raisins or dates. Raisins, all. yes, that's, that's what I was looking for. Um, yeah, I was getting raisins at the start. I'm going to say there's there's one flavor that was jumping out at me. I'm not going to say just it because I think I'm going to ruin it for everyone. So I'm going to say that at the end after moving on to the next whiskey because um, I think it will, uh, it will turn some heads. So I'm not going to say it just yet. Like like we had with the toasted pineapple mm. and the black black pits. I don't want to say it just yet because it will might affect you looking at this whiskey. There's not a lot of spice on the actual initial start itself but as soon as it hits the roof your mouth spice kind of starts to come alive it's it's not exactly cracked black pepper or white pepper what we're kind of used to it's it's really strange really prickly yeah um like i'm like huge amount of sweetness i like obviously the, the i think the sherry cask here is is 
uh, quite visible in this, um, and you can really you can really sense it. Like again, raisins and prunes and like mixed with maybe bitter chocolate, like a little bitter chocolate note or something along those lines. Uh, what you guys think? Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's very interesting. Uh, and again, as I was saying, it's something that um, it's made in the old Yamazaki distillery before they did any work in rejuvenating it in the 80s, before they were using grain from UK, uh, before they stopped malting their own grain. So it really is um, a, a piece of history that we're tasting. And I was very lucky that this was the, the latest uh, entrant to, to, the, to the lineup. Uh, I managed to find it early January. I was very, very lucky to find it, and uh, I had to include it. Um, it it's like I. You think Japanese whiskey be more smoky, but this is much, much closer. I think to an Irish style of whiskey, like a really nice, nice blended single malt, mm -hmm. more than you would get like a, a peated Scotch, which they've really, mm -hmm. you know. Well, that's it. There's a ton of dryness on the on the finish itself, but it's not like whispers of peat or whispers of smoke in any way. It's not even char or anything like that. But there is a lot of dryness, and that yeah, it's that cherry cask up front that's not cloyingly sweet, but it, it really rounds off everything. Um, give you kind of confe almost confectionery sweetness, but as soon as that kind of starts to dry away, you can actually yeah, like, start to taste what the the whiskey is like. Um, like hard apple sweets mm. or something along those lines. Um, something that you'd you'd find in a sweet shop and the kind of Maybe even a, like a, a chocolate with like a cherry and like a li li liqueur kind of cherry chocolate, something along those lines. It's uh, yeah, it's very interesting. But I might say it now. The 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 smell I was getting initially, I was thinking curry powder. I don't know if you are getting that, but I was like, smell the first time. Maybe because I opened a fresh bottle, and you know, when it's an older bottle, sometimes you get those off notes. Oh, you can get that right once you're um, using the pestle and mortar, and you're actually cutting everything to powder it down. Yeah, before you actually. Um, yeah, it was getting like it's it. curry powder esque kind of uh, flavor, but I I couldn't say exactly. But yeah, it's it's very interesting uh, to say the least. Um, yeah. What else can I say? Um, the bottle, the bottle in itself, it was named the Kuromaru, and basically means black circle. So that's that was the original name. You probably can see the black circle in it. Uh, very pretty bottle. I think they they were he was trying to mimic is it Punabon Deluxe? Mm. It was more squarish, mm. dark bottle. That's what he apparently was. Um, uh, was aimed at uh, the Centauri name was actually also related some a little bit to his name and a little bit to the brand that he developed. So I was talking about the Akadama Port and the Akadama Port. He got the name from the Red Circle. Akadama meaning the Red Circle in Japanese, and he got the name for it because in his shop he was also selling some perfumes and he seen a really nice perfume bottle from Europe that had like this red kind of circle as a design of the bottle. So he decided to name it Akadama, which is red dot. So red dot representing the sun. He took that from Akadama, put sun, and then put Tori as his last name. And that's what you got some Tori. Um, but yeah, very interesting. 1970s, something that you wouldn't be able to uh, get anymore because at the to at the moment now, Suntory would use whiskeys from all three distilleries that they have. So. <coughs> piece of history and say leave a little bit for yourself on the side because the next one we're tasting is younger brother which is same whiskey but it was made in mid 90s early 2000s and um, so while we're getting into that one i maybe talk about the two other distilleries that Suntory has which is the hakshu and the cheetah so we'll start with hakshu maybe uh, so Hakshu was built in 1973 and it was basically to give more uh, variation on the styles of uh, different whiskies produced uh, for Suntory brand. Uh, initially they've built Hakshu 1, it was called, and they had six pairs of stills there at the time, which added to 12. Uh, in 1977 they built Hakshu 2. 
which was added another six six pairs of stills, which brought him up to 12 pairs would be 24 individual stills. Uh, at that time, the, that distillery, Hakshu 1 and 2, was called the Hakshu East. Was it East or was it West? Say East. So uh, Hakshu East was the, the first one. 24 stills, 44 uh, stainless steel fermentation tanks, four mash tons. It was massive. It was the biggest uh, pot still whiskey uh, distillery in the world at the time. So huge. Uh, and then in 1981, they just said, Right, so we're going to shut this down now completely and we're going to build another one. Literally, they just shut it down in the 80s and built another uh, distillery which they call Hakushu 3 or Hakushu West now. And that's where all the whiskey is made. Hakushu 1 and 2 or Hakushu East is completely closed off. It's just a museum now. And the reason they closed it down was uh, basically two things. Uh, the first distillery had 24 stills. Each one of them was exactly the same, both washes and spurses are exactly the same. And the idea was just to produce more of the same. And that was in the time when there was a huge whiskey boom in the 70s. So obviously they needed to uh, make a huge amount of uh, spirit very quickly. So they decided just to concentrate on the volume. And then in the 80s, they just think, thought, mm, maybe it's not such a good idea. We'd like to go more into the premium category. But we don't have a distillery for it anymore because it's all kind of focused on like producing volume. So they just say, okay, we'll scrap that one now and we'll build another one. And they build Hakushu 3. And they focused on having different types of stills, just, just like you had in Yamazaki. They wanted to, to make sure that there's different types of stills, different um, methods used in, the, in different ways to make sure that they have a bigger variety of spirits produced. Um, they only use a wooden fermentation tanks there. Uh, the distillery in itself is at the, at the foot of uh, Mount Kaikumagatake. Just got that right. I was working on that one in my sleep. Uh, it's 700 meters above the sea level, so it's quite high up. It's in a beautiful lush forest. Uh, the company itself actually bought huge amounts of land, but they, they're not using probably even a fifth of it. Uh, because they want to keep the natural beauty and the na natural serenity of the place as it was. They really don't want to damage the natural environment around the distillery. In fact, they, they have actually set up a bird sanctuary on the birds that are flying up and down uh, to have a safe haven there uh, and to replenish whatever they have to before their next flight and next journey. Uh, so they do look after the environment quite a lot and they, they're making sure that uh, everything is kept as it was before they left before they started working there. Uh, the water there is extremely pure, and by extremely pure, I mean very pure. Uh, it has only 30 milligrams of dissolved solids in the water. So for example, your bottle of Pellegrino, should be considered a very good drinking water, would have 600, 260 milligrams of sol different solids. So like, you know, your calcium, your potassium, all that stuff that you'd like to have in water, but not necessarily maybe in whiskey production, you kind of want to have as little as possible, so you have a clean water. And it, it's so clean, in fact, that they actually have a bottling facility and they bottle water there called the Tenesui, and it's the most popular uh, water in Japan. So if you ever go to Japan and you're, uh, you need to add a little bit of water to your whiskey, make sure you use Tenesui because it is water that's also used to make whiskey. So, yeah, you'll have a nice pair. Um, uh, yeah, so they have wooden fermentation tax. They also have different types of stills. They also have eight pairs of stills. Again, they use it the same way as Yamazaki. Usually they use it concurrently. Wash the one, spirit the one, but they can do variations also. If uh, They argue that wooden fermentation tanks are better for the climate that the Hakushu distillery is there because it's higher. Uh, the temperature are a bit lower, so it's a little bit easier to... Um, control uh, the fermentation as well as they feel like uh, the, the, the wood works better in that climate um, they use oregon oregon pine sorry or um, douglas fir for both in yamazaki and hakushu uh, in 2010 they did added a column distillation there up until then up until 2010 it was all malt all malt uh, distillery but they did add a continuous still uh, in 2010 and started distilling there in 2013. I believe they did release a single grain whiskey from Hakushu, 
but I mean, problem is very limited and probably very hard to come by. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't chance of getting a bottle anytime soon. But it is there, so they are playing around uh, with different liquids. Um, for maturation, they don't use mizanara oak here at all, and they tend not to store any bigger barrels in the Hakushu uh, warehouses because they are too small. The racking uh, system is a little bit too small for bigger barrels like a port pipe, sherry boats, whatever. So they do ship uh, the bigger barrels to Omi, so they concentrate on smaller barrels uh, here a little bit more. And then in 72, they've opened the Cheetah, which is a grain distillery. Uh, it's situated at the port, I think closer to Kyoto. I could be wrong. I can't remember exactly what city it's from, but it's close to bigger cities anyway. Uh, they mainly produce... Uh, Grain whiskey from corn. Corn is usually the main ingredient. Uh, Cheetah was called the silent distiller because up until I think it was 2014 and 15, we didn't see anything coming out from Cheetah. It was all used for blends. So all the grain whiskey that was made there was used in blends. Um, in their mash bills, they tend to use up to 10 different types of grains, corn being the most predominant uh, grain that they use for the, the distillation of the grain. And they produce uh, three type of uh, three types of uh, distills. So they produce uh, clean, medium, and heavy. Uh, clean passes through four stills. Uh, four continuous stills. Uh, medium passes through three, and uh, the heavy passes through four. No, sorry. Clean passes through four. Medium passes through three. Heavy passes through two. Uh, so the heavier one passes less. So obviously, you get uh, more fusel oils and and all those estuary flavors that you would lose in the concurrent distillation processes. Um, so since this one is from the 90s, we'd expect that it would have the distillates from all three distillers since they're open then and they had enough probably age stock that they were able to supply um, that whiskey with different components. So I would say this is a blend of all three. Uh, Suntory Old, as a brand is probably the most popular brand in the 80s at the very height of the Japanese whiskey boom. They sold 130 million of Centauri Old bottles. The population of Japan at the time was 117 million. So they sold more bottles than there was people in Japan at the time. So it was very successful. and was the brand that they were pushing a lot uh, as well. So get to try this now. You have Jim in there with nose much lighter, warm hay and grass, better balance than number one for him. And uh, number one, look harsh and very light on the end. Yeah, so the the the, the prickliness it's uh, that you're talking about in the first one mm -hmm. is um, is different now. It's as it's more white pepper kind of mm -hmm. spice to it. It is a little bit more perfumey on the nose, that's for sure. That's probably the, the grain component and playing the, the bigger part here, I'd say. But there is some sweetness to it as well, on top of it. By it compared to the first one, first one, as we're thinking, is all sherry. That feels like it's been pulled apart from more than one type of barrel, more than one type of yeah. distillate. Yeah. And like there is a couple of things at play, trying to have a, a scream and a shout and let you know that they're there. As soon as there's sweetness, it's kind of pulling and dry, and as soon as it starts to dry, there's a bit of sweetness again. And there is a there's an astringency to it, but it's not like extremely off-putting. There's just kind of like a, a hint of an off note on all the sweetness, kind of like a, a slight bitter note right at the end. Yeah, when you, for instance, as we we're saying before, when you're eating um, the the first one, you get that kind of raisin sweetness. Yeah. With this, uh, if you've ever like soaked raisins in alcohol, when you pull the sweetness out, it starts to get bitter you've almost gone too far to the point where you pulled away all the raisin flavor. But this is kind of like you've still got that that sherry, date, and raisin, but the alcohol is kind of pulling it out like it's a second or third. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. But overall, I mean, in color, they got it bang on, really. Like, I mean, it's a, the 20 year difference in the color are pretty much the same. Like, I mean, I compared it a few times in the previous times I would take or taste in them for, to take notes and I was very impressed that like the, the DNA in itself is there obviously this is more malt this is probably more grain than malt but the DNA I think it's, it's still there obviously it did, did change quite a bit 
but the the general idea I think behind Suntory uh, is still there. The mall components are to say nine to ten years old from what Suntory have emailed me back. So the mall component that's in it is about nine to ten years old. Obviously, I would imagine that there is some sort of a grain component in this as well. Like it is much much lighter. Like you compare and contrast the two together, like much lighter, much uh, much smoother. Um, they actually have the Suntory all of those times. They actually had two different types. So this is rich, rich and mellow. They also had uh, smooth and mild. Yeah, smooth and mild. I'd like to I'd like to taste the two side by side as well. I couldn't find the, the third bottle. I think again three bottles of Suntory in the same tasting um, would be a little bit different. Uh, yeah, so people saying that the notes are that number two much lighter. Uh, yeah, that's Jim. Jimmy. Yeah. So as you say, more more heavier, more fusel oils. Uh, more more punch of the sherry this is much lighter much kind of easy going blend now bear in mind that uh, japanese consumers do usually cut their whiskies with water or they drink it in a different way they tend not to drink whiskey on their own so i would recommend to maybe try some of them with a little bit of water and see see how that changes your perception of the whiskey because like i mean they were designed to be mixed with water it is very common for japanese uh people to drink it with water it's called actually the mizuwari which is basically in japanese means cut with water so do play around with that in a bit of water if you want to if you don't it's perfectly fine it's your samples you can do whatever you want with them to be honest but yeah um um cheetah the, the grain distillery in itself actually was a 50-50 a split uh, a distillery, so 50% of the funds were placed by Centauri and 50% were posted by a, call, a company called Zeno, and they are kind of an agriculture uh, company that deals with uh, making all sorts of foodstuffs, so they, they own part of it. It was actually up until, I think, 2019, the cheetah was actually not called Centauri cheetah, it was called Sun Grain cheetah, now it was changed to Centauri cheetah. Uh, it's not open to the public. The other two distilleries are open to the public. Uh, if you ever be, be to, uh, going through Japan, definitely recommend to go to at least one of them. They're both beautiful. They're both fantastic. Uh, they're both something really unique to it. Um, both are in like this surreal climate. And if you all look at any of the pictures, they really are fantastic. I was taking all the virtual tours when I was doing my research. So kind of been there, but not really, you know. Um, whatever you can do through a computer, but yeah, I've, I've transport, transported myself to Japan for at least a, a little while and visited the distilleries there. But yeah, they, they are fantastic if you ever get a chance. I'd love to visit them myself. They they look unbelievable, completely different um, way of looking at things than in here, I suppose. And by the way, any company that you see here, like we're tasting whiskeys from four companies but we have seven pours it's really hard to say oh nika is nika and then centauri is centauri because like one company will have three distilleries or two distilleries and it's really hard to say that one company is, makes one whiskey because that's not true like each each of those distilleries have their own little style and their own different ways of making things happen so talking about centauri and talking about nika you really are talking about a big percentage of the whiskey industry in Japan because they they own quite majority of the distilleries out there. Mm -hmm. Obviously there are some others. They, there's more and more popping out left, right and center right now, as it is in Ireland and Scotland and whatnot. So uh probably see quite a lot more coming out from the Japan in the near future. Uh yeah, we move on to the number three now I think. Yeah, like as you're saying with Nika, the yeah. tasting that we did two years ago, one of the ambassadors, mm. she was saying like um the this, between like um the super malt, the Nika from the barrel, and a few different ones, they're using the advantage of all three distilleries to basically drop everything to NAS or non-A statement. But because you have such variety between the three, they're purely down to blending. Their blending techniques are exactly. fantastic. Um, like yeah. you, you were saying before about the the Hakushu grain, the Nika coffee grain, and the Nika coffee malt, they would be uh, if they were. In That's Ireland, what they're yeah, kind of aiming yeah, at. If, okay. if they were in, um, if they're in Ireland, they wouldn't be allowed to call everything as is. 
because the super malt is basically pulling malt from different distilleries. Yeah. The Nika from the barrel is not a cast strength, which we all thought it was. It's actually pulling uh, different barrels from the, the three different or two two out of three different distilleries and bringing it all down to a constant ABV. Yeah. That's higher than normal. That's why they're saying from barrel because it's it's their way of saying almost cast strength. Um, but yeah, they're they're playing off the fact that they have more than one resource and more than one place to pull from. And as you're going to go into later when it comes to other distilleries from other countries. You, the, the you would game. exactly see the same thing. Yeah. And it is quite common. Mm -hmm. Japanese producers don't like sharing things. They're keeping things to themselves. Yeah. Like in Scotland, you see barriers being swapped out all the time and they have no problem with it whatsoever. That's how they do it there. Japan, no, no. They produce everything by themselves. They want to have as wide a variety of, of whiskies produced in-house as possible. And that's how then they can produce really spectacular whiskey that won many awards. And that's down to their blending. Their blending is uh, second to none, probably one of the best things on the planet right now. And they, they really are very good at what they're doing. And they have the variety, they have the choice. They, they are producing quite a lot of different styles. And you'll see that throughout when you're going along to taste in anyway. Okay, so we finished with Suntory. Uh, yeah, so they have three distilleries, a lot of liquid being produced. Yamazaki produces 6 million liters a year. Hakushu produces 4 million liters a year. And Cheetah produces somewhere around 4 to 5 million liters a year. So quite a lot of whiskey. Obviously, right now, as I said, we're very low on the, on the market right now because it's been basically dried out. But what happened was in early 2000s, for example, in Yamazaki, uh, the stills were actually running only once a week on Mondays. In early 2000s so you can see why the situation went from having loads of japanese whiskey then having none in a very quick short period of time and um, that's because they've basically scaled down their operations from the 90s up until the early 2000s and then picked it back up well, you uh, have jim murray's whiskey bible as soon as he named that it was a 12 year old jamazaki and a sherry cast that you can only get in asia uh -huh. as soon as he named that number one in the world everybody wanted to taste yamazaki as you said, because they were only distilling once a week. Very hard to replenish stocks if you're distilling once a week. All those, pretty much all those distillers from Suntory were back fully operational in 2010. So 20, 2008, the boom happened and they were like scrambling and they're like, oh my God, we're running out of everything. And in 2010, they restarted back up everything and, you know, scaled it back up. And they also had a, another warehouse uh, close to Hakushu, which they closed down in early 2000, demolished it. They were like, oh, well, it's not going well, so we're just going to shut it down. And then in 2010, they're like, boom, what's happening? They have no idea. And, you know, it is really hard for them to replenish all the stocks. But as it is now, we're coming to that kind of a 10 year period when we should be seeing more things happening now in the next two years, I'd say. I, probably that's why the regulations are coming in now because all those distilleries are getting to that point and they actually have the stock to be able to replenish it. So that's probably why. Right. Move on to Nika. Um, McConnell's Whiskey just did uh, share like this really inspiring story or something like that recently on Instagram. Right. There's some sort of a competition. So if you want to win it, tell him this story. This story is absolutely amazing. Like this guy, this guy is the biggest badass you'll ever see in your entire life or you ever hear in your entire life. Um, big cojones. That's all I'm going to say. Like, and listen to the story because it's amazing. Um, so Masataka Takatsuru was born in... 1918, 1894. Uh, he was born to a family of sake producers, and they are quite prevalent sake producers since uh, mid 1700s. So they're involved with the alcohol business. He was involved in the alcohol business since the start. He graduated from a sake technical college in food fermentation in 1916, and was. Uh, hired by Shetu Suzo uh, after recommendation from Kiricho Iwai, which we will get into later on because he's another uh, fella that will play part in the next company that we're going to taste whiskey in. And they, they hired him uh, into the brewery and basically they wanted to be the first uh, true whiskey producers in Japan. So they wanted to develop whiskey production uh, in their factory. So what they did was they sent them over to Scotland 
1918. Um, he was sent off by his parents, by Mr. Tory himself, and by Mr. Iwai. And another guy that would play a part later on in his life was Mr. Yamamoto, which became a president of Asahi Brewery. Um, sent off, went to uh, San Francisco first, stopped in California for three months, uh, uh, studied and worked on a wine uh, farm that was owned by Japanese uh, uh, people uh, that emigrated to America. Then went on to Scotland and started studying there. So he enrolled in Glasgow University and took organic chemistry classes. And um, he initially wanted to go there, obviously, to study whiskey making. And he wanted to uh, study under Mr. What is his name? Metal. Metal something, anyway. And this guy wrote a book beforehand. And Mr. Takatsuru uh, wrote, uh, wrote, read the book and he was interested in his take on distillation. It's all about distillation processes and how to make whiskey and other spirits and whatnot. So you want to study under the guy that wrote, uh, wrote the book. Unfortunately, he couldn't afford it because uh, his fees were quite exuberant. So what he did was he said the next best thing. He took out a map with the distilleries in front of him and he just said, okay, which one's the closest? So Long Arm is the closest, right? So we go to Long Arm. And knocked at the door and said, "Hello, I'm Masataka Takasura. I'm from Japan, and I'd like to, uh, sh I'd like you to show me how to make whiskey." And he said, "Come on in, chap. Let's go. We'll show you around." Um, lasted there for about five, five days. They showed him around and all. Very impressed. Uh, loved the way that they've accepted him. Like nothing happened, you know. Showed him around, and uh, he started to develop his notes during that time. It was the first time. He visited the Scottish distillery. He visited, he, oh, oh, during his two years in uh, Scotland, he visited two distilleries, um, sorry, nine distilleries. Uh, up until there, he was uh, he was there until 1920s. He visited nine distilleries. He took uh, college classes as well on top of that. Worked in all of them and tried to help out and trying to learn the process. Uh, but yeah, the three main distilleries that he was uh, he was studying at was Longarmon, Hazelbourne, which is closed down, and James Calder Distillery in Bowness. There's two Bowness distilleries. One was gone in 1700. The other one was gone in not so long after Masataka left. Uh, he left. He learned malt distilling in Long Ormond and uh, Hazelbourne and grain distillery in Bowness. On top of that, took in, taking the classes, learn about all Scottish uh, distillation and taking notes and making sure that he written down and did loads of different diagrams to be very specific to get all the knowledge down on paper. He also found love uh, by the name of James Erica Cowan, uh, also call, called as Rita. She was actually, he was actually introduced to her by her younger sister, Ella. Um, he fell in love. She fell in love with him. The sister wasn't too happy. The parents weren't too happy. His parents were furious. They are so furious, in fact, that they went to the owner of Chateau Suzu, Mr. Abe, and told him to sort him out because they didn't like the fact that he was marrying some Scots girl and he, they wanted him back. So Mr. Abe packed his uh, bag, went to Scotland, trying to convince uh, Mr. Takitsuru to change his mind. Uh, but he had his own personal uh, stake in it as well because he had a, a daughter that he hoped that Takatsura was going to marry when he was back. Didn't work out that way. Uh, so yeah, everyone's very furious. On top of the owner of the company he was working for and that paid for his trip, the, the parents of uh, the girl, his own parents. Uh, yeah, so he really didn't care. He said, he said to Rita that he would happily stay in Scotland if she wants him to, but Rita said, look, I know you want to pursue your dream of producing whiskey in your country, and I'll happily travel with you, and she did. So in 1920, they went back to uh, Japan, and he started then working. Uh, and when he was back, they, they realized that Seto Shuzo wasn't going to go ahead with um, whiskey production just after the war. The situation with grains wasn't good. The company was a little bit struggling. So he departed the company after he was back. He worked as a chemistry teacher for a few years. And then in 1923, he was hired by uh, Mr. Tori, looked after the distillery of Suntory of Yamazaki, which I already said. 
he left in 34 and went on ahead and tried to establish his own distillery. So from the get-go, he had a disagreement with, uh, with Tori because he wanted to build it on the island of Hokkaido, which is in the north part. It's the northern island up the north of Japan. Uh, the climate is very similar to Scotland, so he wanted to emanate the, this, this, the kind of Scottish highlands, that kind of, you know, snow, damp, moist, high humidity, uh, not very big jumps in temperature throughout the year. So that's where he wanted to build his distillery. And that's where he wanted to build the Yamazaki or the, the Yamazaki distillery. But Mr. Tori wanted somewhere closer to big ports, big cities where there's more happening and um, sending whiskey was much easier than going by, by sea and then, you know, hoping for the best that the ship didn't crash or there wasn't breakages or whatever. So. He didn't want to build it there, but Takatsuro was very adamant. So it was like a battle between a businessman and an, and, a, and an artist. The businessman being the Tory and Takatsuro being the artist. He was looking at quality, where he was looking at more of the business side of things, which is good. Like, I mean, uh, I think both things are very important when you're making a brand like that, you know. Uh, but yeah, one, one and the other were basically on the opposite side of the spectrum. So obviously, their relationship didn't last that well. So after 10 years, he left. Uh, built a distillery uh, of Yoichi in 1934. Initially, he was making only apple juice uh, to fund his whiskey escapade. And the reason he went for apple juice was the fact that uh, Hokkaido was very uh, famous for producing apple juice. There's a lot of apple trees there, and it's a very common crop and very cheap crop. So. He decided to uh, go with apple juice to fund his uh, operation. Very unsuccessful. Once again, uh, he had a problem with the glue on the bottles. They were peeling off. Uh, after pouring apple juice into it, uh, it went cloudy after a few days, so consumers didn't really want to drink it, so it went all back. In fact, he actually didn't even know how to make apple juice initially. He bought a book on how to produce juices in 1931 when he visited uh, Scotland back with uh, Tori's son, Kichir Kichirito. Um, so he got a book and he literally just read it from the book and made it like that. Um, since there was uh, basically all the juice was sent back, he came up with an idea to distill it and make brandy out of it. That sold a little bit better, obviously. Uh, in 1936, he started distilling. Initially, he only had one still, so he did two runs in one still. So he did his, his wash and then his spirit first, second, uh, in the same still. Uh, during the war, obviously, th there wasn't much of a problem selling things because the Japanese army was buying absolutely everything, so that wasn't much of an issue. Uh, after the war, when the whiskey classes were established, he really, really didn't want to do third or second or first class whiskey. He only wanted to concentrate on the special class, but after about a few months, uh, all the different shareholders of the company just basically knocked it out of his head saying that you have to start making money, pal, otherwise we're not going to have this ship sailing for too long. So he went along with it. But he was very adamant on making sure that the whiskey in all the lower grades was at the maximum level so that the whiskey was of, uh, of the most premium quality that bear name Nika. The Nika name origin, originates from the original name of the company called the Dai Nippon Kaju, which means um, apple, a Japanese juice making factory, I think. And then it was just shortened down to Nika in 1940s, I think. Um, so yeah, he was very adamant of doing the things the way he wanted it, and he made sure that with Yoichi as well. Uh, up until this day, Yoichi is probably, I think it's the only distillery, unless there's some very small distilleries that uses direct coal fire under the stills, which is like very uncommon. I think that Glendronic was the last distillery in Scotland that abandoned this practice. Um, still, They still do it till this day, which is just uh, absolutely, absolutely unbelievable, I think. Um, where am I? I think a few taste notes coming through here. If you want to tap on, yeah, absolutely. All right, Steve Osford, you got hint of spice, stack fruits, 
Um, Brian the Whiskey Chaser is loving the apple and banana on the nose and confessionary sweetness for himself. Uh, Owen is thinking refresher bar, so popping back to the last taste, and obviously yeah. that, that note is sticking in his head, which is great to see. Um, Patrick Walsh is recommending The Way of Whiskey by Dave Broom. Great book. Um, so, anyway, back to the story of Taxi. It's lovely, by the way. I really love this. I'm getting raspberries all the time mm -hmm. when I'm drinking this. But yeah. Um, so, after the war, trying to concentrate on the premium market, obviously, there was no premium market at the time. So, he moved on to making lower grade whiskies. Um, in 1961, his sweetheart uh, Rita died. He was crushed by her death, and he actually released a very special whiskey called Super Nika, which I tried. It's very nice. Uh, it was very limited edition. The first run, it was only a thousand bottles. Every bottle was uh, hand blown crystal or hand cut crystal. They don't blow crystal, I think. No, yeah. talking on my arse. Uh, but yeah, it was uh, it was to commemorate her and all her hard work. She she basically supported him throughout she stood by him throughout um behind every man there is always a strong woman and i think that's a very that's a very good example one there sitting as well um but yeah he 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 really had to dedicate a lot to her because when they were struggling she also did piano lessons and english lessons to kids around the place to fund the operation and she stood by him ever since you know being a Scotswoman and traveling to Japan right before the war, like right in between the wars, like it must have been like crazy. Like you don't hear of these things too often today. Like, and what about like 1920s? Like, yeah, it must have been like unbelievable to see something like that happen. And, and you know, um, I, I haven't heard a story like that. But anyway, in 1963, he decided to expand. And he was in the search of a new site for a distillery. And he sent on his nephew to find a, a perfect site. So obviously he did a bit of scouting around and they settled on the northern side of the main island of Japan in the Sendai region. And he found, I think, four spots there. And, you know, they went to the first one. Obviously, Takatsura had to be the, the last one to sign off on and saying, yeah, I'm happy enough with this. So. They brought him to the site. They sat down at the, 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 the river, which was named the Nikawa, which if you translate it over to English would be called Nika River. Uh, pure coincidence. He sat down and said, I want some whiskey. So he took out a glass. They gave him some, some other miniature of Nika black in his pocket, gave it to Mr. Takatsuro. He poured down his whiskey, took a little bit of water from the river, uh, diluted it down with that water, tried the whiskey and said, yeah, that's the spot. Let's go with that. So they never even visit the other sites that he scouted. Um, and that's where Miyagikyo distillery um, was going to be placed. Uh, it was finished in 1969 and it was basically a polar opposite to the Yoichi. So Yoichi concentrates on very, very heavy peated, very estuary, very pungent styles of whiskey, whereas Miyagiko is more lighter, more softer, uh, polar opposites, essentially. You have heavy style and you have the kind of a lighter style, and that's what they wanted to achieve with the two distilleries, so they had the two. They also had a, a plant, uh, which was a joint venture between them and Asahi called the Nishimoya, uh, and that was running up until 99, and that's where they had their coffee stills, which he bought from in Scotland from Blair's in about 1963-64. Blair's actually don't exist anymore, they don't produce anything. Uh, they still use those continuous stills up until this day. Uh, they are removed in 99 to Miyagikyo, and that's where they are since. Nishimoya plant, I think, was uh, damaged by an earthquake, and they've dismantled the plant since. They're making some beer, they're bottling some beer as well, but uh, at the end they moved it to Miyagikyo uh, in 99, and that's where the coffee malt and coffee grain that you were talking about is produced since. Some of the older expressions, they actually uh, did have some of the grain distillates from the older distillery, but I, I think it's very hard to pinpoint which, which are which. Um, um, yeah, so I maybe touch a little bit more about the Yoichi. So Yoichi uh, has six stills, uh, four wash stills, two spirit stills. 
four washstands are directly coal fired. Uh, very uncommon. Like I mean, the temperature is very high, very hard to control. Uh, it runs about I think sixteen hundred, no, eight eight to thousand degrees Celsius under the still. So it's very high, very high to hard to control. So every six to eight minutes, if you ever visit the Uchi distillery, obviously I only visit it online. But if you ever visit the Uchi distillery, every six to eight minutes a guy comes in and either chucks some more coal or you know he evens out the fire to make sure that uh, that the uh, the fire is, is evenly spread and the temperature is just right. Um, they wanted to push away from using coal fires in the early 2000s, but the problem was that they really didn't want it. There were some people in the company that said, look, this is an outdated. No one is using this. Why the hell would you even bother using coal fire, which is not clean, it's bad for environment, la da la da da So many different things against it, but they said, look, this is our tradition. This is what we're doing at Yoichi, and we're not going to change it. She installed scrubbers, which obviously cleaned the smoke out of the coal fires at much higher cost than it would be to replace uh, the stills and the heating elements and whatnot. They decided to go with the most, more expensive and harder option rather than go easy. So, again, it really just goes to show that they really want to concentrate on keeping the heritage together there as well and making sure that Takatsuru uh, idea lives on. Um, Miyagiko is a little bit different. It's all steam heated. Uh, the stills are much bigger as well, and they concentrate on, on lighter styles of whiskey. Um, the still number four, El Hiyuichi, is actually the original still that was very, that was the first still that was installed in 1934. They're still using it to, to this day. So, like, talking about history, like, it was a still that was touched by. The man himself and it's still being used today and some of that liquid is definitely in that uh, whiskey so since it is a pure malt it's a blend of single malts from different distilleries in scotland you can't call it pure malt anymore the scotch whiskey association changed that they they are not allowing the, the producers to name that anymore they have to call it blended malt now um it's basically down to the fact that when you ship to the the states, for instance, the FDA, the word pure mean it, it comes across like it's good for you. Like it's oh, medically okay. good. So that's a, it's like pure pot still. The reason why they drop the word pure is it, it, it gives across the wrong terminology and they, they think it's the wrong thing. Makes sense. Um so the Takatsuru uh, range was firstly released in November two thousand and it started off with a twelve year old. It was very reasonably priced. An equivalent 12-year-old in the market in Japan at the moment was double the price. So it was, it was very successful. They sold, they sold all the bottles, and it was half a million bottles they made in the first run very quickly. Uh, and then they also did a 25-year-old limited release of 700 bottles. If you have a bottle, give me a shout. I'd love to try it. Uh, they... Over time, they've added on more uh, age statements. There was a 15, a 17, and a 21 that they added up until 2008, 2010-ish, I think. And then they slowly, slowly started discontinued. It was called the Nika Shock, basically. They had such big shortages in, in, in the early, mid-2000s, uh, mid-late 2000s that they... Um, they dropped, I think, 20-something different uh, expressions from their portfolio, just like that. You say, oh, not making it anymore. Sorry, let's see later. And replaced it with this. And this was released in 2015. And it was basically to fill the hole in the Takitsuru uh, gap that was left after 12, 15, 17, and 21 was discontinued. So they had to come up with something. Obviously, they didn't have enough age stock. So what they did was there is a higher component of Miyagiko malt in this than there is to Yoichi. Obviously, you can probably get that by the taste as well. It's not as heavy, not as smoky, but there is a nice hint of smoke there lingering in the back. Um, it's around 10 to, 15, 10 to 12 years old from what Nika emailed me back, but again, it's hard to say. Uh, they did say that there was a, a, a a little amount of outsourced whiskey added to this particular blend. This blend was discontinued now, I think in 2018, and they just re-released that with a newer blend uh, being in it. So the newer blend is actually 100% Japanese to follow the new rules. But there, as far as I know, 
there is a little bit of uh, most likely Ben Nevis because they own Ben Nevis as well. So there's a little bit of Ben Nevis there as well. Um, added to it just to probably counteract the fact that they they didn't have enough age stock. Uh, I would say vast majority of it is Japanese. They're probably just looking for that very fine component just to fine tune that whiskey just to make sure that uh, it was right bang on the way they wanted, the way to, to follow the Takitsuru range better. You know, they, they wanted to, to concentrate on the fact that they, they all had their own little character. Each uh, each range had a different character, so they want to make sure that they, they kept that with this non-age statement. So, yeah. Jesus, I talk a lot. <laughs> At a blind taste, if didn't know what it was, I would swear that this was like 60-70% pork cask, the other 30-40% um, sherry cask, or maybe the world's smallest bit of bourbon in it. The fortified wine kind of flavours are just huge. That, as you're saying, red berries, dark fruits that the lads are saying, yeah. it just... It's just absolutely massive. And the, the smoky component to it seems to be a lot more kind of drawing the flavors out than it is bitter impact. Yeah. Um, it's very hard to actually get the, the, the barrels that they use for each whiskey. And I think it's down to the fact, like they never, they usually never tell you. I, I got an email a couple of the series and it's, it's very hard for them to pinpoint what barrels they use for each whiskey. Sometimes it is easier because it's a single cask or whatever, but usually in the, in the blends like that, they use such a wide variety of different uh, casks and flavors and distillates that they have under their umbrella that it's very hard for them to pinpoint the end breakdown of the casks because it could be so many with so many different, you know, malts being used as we were saying with Centauri. I would imagine that uh, uh, Nika does pretty much the same with their double distillation process that they are mixing and switching different stills and all that. So uh, it's very hard for them to pinpoint what actual whiskey goes into each blend which I, like you know it's like asking jameson like what well, cask you use like you know it's impossible to to pinpoint but it's a spectacular blend like i mean you, they the older expression of the takitsuru malts they they won a couple of awards in different years and um, there's quite a few i think there's a five or six uh different awards that they've won so yeah absolutely spectacular a great representation of what uh I think Mr. Takatsuru was about making his whiskey and what Nika as a brand is about. I can't wait to see more coming out of both Suntory and Nika. And I'd say we're going to see a lot more soon. And hopefully we'll be able to get our hands on it because, as you know, at the moment it's pretty much impossible. Um, to taste. But yeah, so far what people actually think, what's, um, what's the best whiskey so far? I mean, I'd like to hear your opinion, which which we think it's the best of them all. Maybe take a little break after this as well. Um, could be ideal. We'll see. Yeah, 25 past eight. 25 past eight. Yeah, we might take a little break yeah. now. Uh, just hear people's opinions, which which ones are the favorites so far. Obviously, we have a little um, delay. Yeah. yeah, cool. If you want to take five minutes, find the bathroom in your house, don't use the pan plots. Yeah, will you cut off there for a second? Yeah, perfect.
Cool. Okay, so we're back. Um, and we are on to another distillery. Um, it's produced by Hombushuzo. So Hombushuzo as a company started in 1871. Initially, they were producing rapeseed oil and cotton production. Uh, in early 1900s, they started diversing their focus into alcoholic beverages. Uh, first, they're making soju out of local sweet potatoes, and that's how I got involved. And they produce, at the moment, they produce so much. Like, I mean, you go to their site, uh, either the Japanese site or their English site, like, I'm blown away by how much actually stuff they're producing. They're producing wine, which is beer, they produce sake, soju, whiskey, like, so much like soft drinks like it's really gin there's so much they produce like it's really hard to even keep uh keep track of what they're doing so uh it's unbelievable um anyway back to the whiskey so they got their whiskey license in 1949 and initially they are making imitation whiskey so they're just you know blending neutral alcohol adding a load of different things to make it look like whiskey and selling those whiskey and uh, third class, low tax, easy to shift, didn't have to age, you know. It's all, it all looks very good, you know, for the, the tax man. So, yeah, they're, they've definitely um, looked into that first. They have hired a guy by the name of Kiricho Iwai, which I mentioned earlier. So, he was the guy that was initially involved with um, uh, Setu Shuzo, and he was the guy that referred Takatsuru to the owners of Setu Shuzo at the time. He was actually the first graduate of the program that uh, Takatsuru took in Osaka Technical College. So he was the he was the part of the inaugural class when this uh, college course started. Um, so he did kind of follow similar steps to Takatsuru, excluding the part where he went to Scotland, obviously. Um, he was hired as a, a technical advisor, and he basically used uh, Taketsuru notes, which he, which he had access to when he was back. So he actually took some of the notes from Taketsuru to uh, follow. So in 1960, um, they set up their Mars set up their first whiskey distillery uh, called the uh, Yamanashi, and they were producing whiskey somewhat similar to the success of the first Shirofu at the Suntory. Very smoky. Very unpalatable. Japanese customers hated it, didn't sell. So the distillery was running from 1960 to 1969, and they shut it down. And uh, Mr. Y died in 1966. So he didn't even get a chance to close down the distillery by himself. But he played a big part, obviously, in the life of Mr. Takatsuru and in the life of Myers Whiskey later on, obviously. Um, so yeah, like I mean, you see this big convergence of so many different people going back to this one person, Mr. Takatsuru. Like he really was the influencing factor in pretty much all of these distilleries. He had some sort of connection to almost all of them, apart from the, the last one. But he had some sort of connection to almost all of them, and he did influence them in some way, shape, or form, whether directly or indirectly. So just adding to the Takatsuru story is just amazing what this guy did in his lifetime. Uh, but anyway, back to back to Mars. Um, so they closed it down in 1969 uh, because the, the whiskey wasn't selling that well and uh, they decided to scrap it and concentrate on other products that they were also producing at the time. Um, in early to mid-70s, so the whiskey industry was picking up big time, so they looked at options of restarting uh, the distillery back up again. So in 78, they started making the first process. And what they did was they've reopened uh, the distillery, but at their headquarters in Kagoshima. And that distillery was running from around 1980s to about 1983, 84, up until they found the right place and the right spot to build a proper whiskey distillery. Uh, in 1985, they shut down that the distillery in Kagoshima. So that's their second distillery they're on now again, uh, and they're building a third one. So the third distillery is called the Shinshu, and that's where uh, that liquid is from. Shinshu was opened in uh, 1985. It was built at the foot of Mount Kagomagatake. Got that right again. Um, it's actually very close to the Hakushu. It's probably, I think, not even 100 k's 
between Hakushu and uh, and the Shinshu distillery. So they're actually building the same mountain range. So Hakushu is built at 700 meters above sea level. So Maris, I think, wanted to up them a little bit. So they built their distillery at 798 meters above sea level. So it's the the highest uh, whiskey distillery in Japan at the moment. So they just, you know, upped it up a little bit more. Karizawa actually, actually was the, 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 the highest whiskey distillery in Japan, but the, in 2016 was demolished. So uh, Shinshu took that uh, that torch off Karizawa and now it's the, the highest uh, distillery. Um, they source their water, obviously, from the same mountain range as uh, Hakushu does. So you'd expect the water being very clean, but they actually decided to find even clearer water and decided to drill a big, massive well that goes down 120 meters uh, further and that's where they're sourcing their water so they, you know they they even didn't want to be the same as Hakushu and they decided to get their water from elsewhere um, that distillery was then running up until 1992 like uh, basically Myers had the worst time in possible I think when it comes to uh, building an open in distillery so in the 60s like the whiskey was doing okay but wasn't doing spectacular so they closed in late late 60s early 70s whiskey picked up again and then in late 70s they decided to open it again uh, uh, re reopen a distillery and by the time that they've built a new distillery uh, in shinshu the market was had a huge decline and we didn't all didn't only see that in japan with whiskey industry in japan but also in scotland and other places that are making whiskey uh, in scotland i think it was still called the whiskey lock of the 80s where there was overproduction of whiskey and there wasn't enough buyers so there was a lot of cult distilleries in scotland that, that had a big following that closed down at that time and you can see the same uh, happening in japan uh yeah uh, suntory was focusing on moving into more premium market rather than the bulk market same with nika so they were kind of scaling down their production in the 80s and um, because they they had to and they wanted to as well at the same time so they opened in, in uh, Shinshin in 85 and in 92 they closed it back down again. So they were very unlucky. Like they're onto their third distillery and they shut it down after just seven years in operation. And it stayed dormant uh, up until 2011 when the whiskey industry picked back up again and they said, mm, maybe we'll try this whiskey thing again and see what happens. Uh, oh, from 92 to 2011, they're still bottling whiskeys. They're just using the old stocks that they had in the warehouses. And then when the 2010 whiskey boom happened, they decided that it won't last for very long. They probably won't even last the end of the year. So they said, shit, we have to make more. Um, so they started their first seasons are very short and they only last three to four months. Uh, they only use about six tons of grain at the time. Um, but each year they scaled up significantly now they use nearly 270 tons a year and their season is not three months long but it's actually 10 months long probably going to be longer over time and um, so you can see a huge step from 2011 till now like i mean they've probably up their up their production a few hundred percent so it's absolutely amazing uh, in fact the stills that were used in the shinshu initially where the origins, original stills that were designed by Mr. Iwai, which based his design off notes of Taketsuru. So Taketsuru was directly involved in the stills that Myers used. Uh, these stills were used up until 2014. I, I calculated out that the stills were dormant for longer than they were actually used. I think it was 29 years dormant and 27 years uh, in use. And then in 2014, they discontinued those those original stills, obviously due to their uh, their age and they're prone to leaking and stuff like that. So they decided to uh, finally upgrade them. But the way they upgraded them was they wanted to make sure that the, the, the shape and the capacity and everything uh, is exactly the same as to the old EY stills. The EY stills are now parked up right outside the distillery. So if you ever visit, you can have a look at them. and you know, and compare and contrast if there's any differences between new stills that are inside the building and the old stills that are uh, outside the building. So uh, they doubled the still there as well. Uh, very interestingly, as when the distillery closed down, they actually built a small brewery as well, 
right beside the distillery. So there was some activity when the distillery was closed. It was just distillers were not used, but the brewery park was used. And it's used um, to this day, they still make beer. So with that, they also have access to quite a wide range of different brewers yeast. They use, uh, they like to use ales yeast as far as I know, because they produce a very uh, flavorful wash. Uh, they use a normal distiller's yeast as well. And they also use, uh, it's called the heritage yeast, I think they call it. And it was the original yeast strain that was developed in 1985 and they still have it and they still use it. So uh, they developed that, that strain in 85 and they have it up until this day, which is very cool. Like they're still, they're still using quite a lot of it. Um, interestingly, they're using uh, stainless steel fermentation tanks, which are quite outdated. They date back to the older distilleries. Uh, there's a little bit of rust on them here and there. I think they're going to replace them. If not, they didn't replace them already because I actually seen that I was on the Instagram story you posted today. There's a video from the Shinshu distillery on our story and it looks like they've updated them. I could be wrong, but it looks like they've updated them through that video. Uh, the, the fermentation, the, the stainless steel fermentation tanks are not very user friendly because they're manu uh, there's a lot of manual labor involved. I uh, have to be hand cleaned because they don't have any cleaning equipment uh, that's uh, mechanized inside. So everything has to be hand cleaned and emptied out. So quite a lot of work and you have to be quite thin to work in Shinshu because they, they, the entryway to the fermentation tank is quite narrow. So I'm definitely not going to fit, unfortunately. But yeah, I'd love to, to have a look at it. Um, let's move on to the whiskey maybe, shall we? Mm -hmm. um, so this is Mars Fubuki. And Fubuki means the snowstorm, and that relates back to the uh, climate that the distillery is built in. Obviously, high up in the mountains, obviously, there's a lot of snow, clear water, all that. So they wanted to emanate that fact. This bottle was released in August 2018 for the Taiwanese market only. As far as I know, it was limited to 1,500 bottles only. So very rare, uh, very hard to come by. Uh, you can see it from time to time on auctions. That's where I got this bottle. Um, it is a blend of malt and grain whiskies, uh, mainly aged in uh, American white oak and ex bourbon. Uh, uh, from what I was told by Momoko uh, Kata, if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, I'm really sorry. I, I, the, my Japanese is terrible. I'd say it's better than the Japanese version of Polish. <laughs> most likely, <laughs> most much. likely, well, uh, Momoko, which uh, works uh, at Mars. Uh, he was very kind to reply in all my emails with all really specific questions. And he was very kind to trying to uh, give me a, the best answer possible. So thank you for that. And he said that there was a small amount of grain whiskey that was outsourced used in this. That's because they didn't up their, uh, their grain whiskey production yet up until that point. Uh, and that's why, because they've, open a, another distillery in 2016 called the Tsunuki and that's where their grain facility is so they're only been distilling there for two years at the time so they didn't have enough of aged grain stock to uh, create this blend um, it, the, the age is on maximum is seven years I would say and uh, no more than that obviously since the distillery was um, was reopened in 2011 and this was bottled in 2018. I wouldn't say it was older than seven uh, years old. I would doubt that they, they used the stocks from the previous distillery run for, uh, that ended in 92. I'd say it's all newer stock that they're using in this. So yeah, let's have a little taste, have a little smell. Definitely the most wood forward of the four we've had, or the five at this stage we've had so far. Yeah, most definitely. I don't know if they use peat in this or if it's just the char of the gas, but from the nose, it does come across like this is the, the smokiest or most charred out um, for so far. So they use four types of different uh, malted barley and different four, uh, four different peat levels. So they use uh, unmalted at zero PPM, uh, very lightly malted at three and a half PPM. So that could be mm -hmm. it. Uh, Cause like, I mean, it's very faint. 
uh, they use 15 to 20 ppm and 40 and above. So they, they use a quite a wide range. In Shinshu, they tend to use unpeated and lightly peated most commonly, obviously, you have your peat days or peat weeks or mm. peat months, and they tend to distill probably down one bigger run. But they tend to favor uh, lightly peated or unpeated whiskies. Which would be interesting, as you're saying, like 2011 to 2018, whereas if they are doing a day, a week, a month worth of um, peating or a, a day, week, a month worth of each one of the stages, if the oldest in this was the heaviest, the mid range or the lightest worth of peat or none. It just shows how much is actually carrying across. It's very delicate on it, but you can. It's you can very delicate it. throughout, to be honest. But that could be the age of it. Mm -hmm. That could be the fact that uh, where they are in Japan, their humidity levels are through the roof. And if you, even if yeah. you you took a normal Irish fifty five ppm, which is the average we have at the moment um, before distillation, if you stuck that onto the island of Japan, you're going from two percent loss to over ten percent loss. Your your ppms are just going to be drowned out. So very high for them could actually be mediocre peat levels for, yeah. for us. Uh, Angel's share at Shinshu is very similar to um, uh, Ireland. It's about it's around three percent, okay. three to five percent. Um, they're um, they're so high up that they have very low temperature fluctuations. They're nearly eight hundred meters up, so the temperature fluctuation there is uh, is quite low. It's more similar to our climate than it is to other distilleries. But saying that, they they do have different ways and methods of having more influence of the cask added to the whiskey which we'll talk about the next one um so mm -hmm. and i won't say it just yet but yeah it's it's common like i think this is super delicate like comparing to all three like the the, the last three had um some sort of a a pungent component something that was sticking out above above all the other components that were there this is more mellowed out it's a it's a like a very complex blend, but nothing is jumping out at you that you'd be able to pinpoint. It's like, okay, that's the predominant flavor. It's it's more delicate, more well-rounded. Um, not happy to drink another bottle of that. I think that's what I'm going to say. Oh, definitely, yeah. It's well, that's it. Because it's so light and delicate, that's the reason, well, for me anyway, that's the reason why you're getting so much wood spice coming across. You're getting that kind of layers of peat coming across because the, the distillate or the, the blending itself seems to just be lightly layered. So that the wood really has a chance to scream and shout. Yeah, yeah, um, definitely um, nice wooded notes of probably Virgin American mm -hmm. oak uh, is definitely in the mix there. And um, again, uh, Momoko wouldn't be able, to, wasn't able to specify exactly what kind of barrels they used. He just said it was a blend of few barrels. So again, I would say that. Now I'm only guessing. I'm, I'm not saying that this is what they do, but. I'm guessing that they said someone came up to them and said, okay, make us a limited edition blend. And they look at the casks, maybe what was low, what wasn't, you know, and maybe use the, the, the lower bits of the cask and just created a really nice blend that was working nicely, you know, that they're happy enough to stick on the label. And they just use different kinds of casks, different different types of malts and different PPM levels as well, I would say, um, to create this. I, I could be wrong. I, I, maybe it wasn't the fact that they, you know, they added some maybe half empty cask and blended them together. But it really is a, a really nice blend. I really like what they've done with this. Um, too bad they don't make only made fifteen hundred bottles. To be honest, no, completely. Like, uh, if it is grain light or grain heavy, it, it's more the wood aspect and uh, that delicate kind of layers of peat that's in it. That smoky kind of appeal, like really drawing out the flavors. It's not. Orchard fruit heavy. It's not no. um, be light berries or dark fruits heavy like we've had in the last couple of few. But the blending skill you can see behind it, yeah, absolutely. is very delicate. It, it's letting it tell a story. It's letting it have um, a good few layers to it. And yeah, definitely. If um, came across another bottle, I'd definitely pick it up. Mm -hmm. Like um, the first one, fantastic. Try something that old. Yeah, fantastic. Try exactly. Something that the you can tell it has a smoky profile, but because of the, the sweetness of the sherry casks, it's complex because it's sweet first, smoky after it starts to dry. The second one, you can see it's a lot more modern day. I know you said 90s to 90s, you can see it's a yeah. lot more modern day irritate, um, of irritate, uh, version of the first one. Yeah. Um, with number three, absolutely fantastic. That's a blender's dream. Premium blend. Uh, yeah, yeah, completely and early. But with this, even if it is grain heavy or grain light, it's hard to tell by the profile. It, it's delicate, but 
it tells as much of a story as the first tree. Yeah, absolutely. In a lot easier drink way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Another really interesting thing is uh, actually the, the corks that they use. Like, uh, I was very baffled by this. So they have a regular cork, right? But uh, it has like some sort of a an epoxy plastic kind of uh, a film over the, the cork in itself. Okay. Um, I would imagine that's to, to, to stop leaks and stuff like that, make it a little bit more secure. But I never never came across uh, that kind of uh, configuration before, so I, yeah, I was you, very baffled by that. And I see it the first time when I opened the yeah, box. Yeah, you've uh, the premium version of you using a cork, not a screw cap, but it's yeah. stopping the thing from breathing. Yeah, exactly. So even if the cork dries out over time, you know, if the bottles have been, uh, you know, stored and they, you know, they weren't enjoyed and um, they were kept away, tucked away, uh, that probably would affect the fact that, you know, uh, even if the cork shrinks, it probably won't affect the seal. So yeah. quite a quite a nifty idea. Uh, I was very, very baffled and very impressed, I suppose, uh, that. And the climate in Japan, the climate in Taiwan, if you are going by yeah. containers across, you going to have huge fluctuations yeah so the, i think that was the, for the safety reasons it was done like that so yeah uh, yeah 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 absolutely very interesting blend uh so far i don't know i'm, I'm kind of baffled between the two i don't know which is my favorite i i, I had a problem kind of pinpointing out do i like the takatsura better or this um hard to say but yeah uh really nice um 1500 bottles so yeah enjoy while you can Right, uh, move on to the second last one. Uh, best to second last, maybe. <laughs> uh, this is uh, also from Mars. Uh, but this is a cask strength, so much, much bolder, obviously. Uh, as I was saying, uh, different companies, they could be producing one one brand of whiskey, but they usually have more than one distillery, and that's the case with uh, Myers also, just like Nika and just like Suntory. Uh, when they reopened the distillery in 2011, they reached full capacity very quickly, and they, they had two options. They could have expanded their distillery, or they could have built another one. And the reason they decided to build another one in a different spot was to, again, give another bit of differentiation between the two distilleries that are that are situated in a completely different climate. So Shinshu, mountains, high up, low temperature fluctuations. Uh, the new distillery that opened in 2016 called Tsunuki. I won't talk too much about it because we are not tasting any anything from Tsunuki Godang being opened since 2016. They've only actually started releasing uh, whiskeys from that distillery in the last year or so, a year or two years or so. Uh, so the, it, it's not as widely available just yet, but wait and see. Uh, I'd say it'd be something very interesting coming out of Tsunoki as well. But again, they wanted to differentiate, they wanted to see what kind of effect uh, of the, the climate has on the whiskey that when it's aging. Um, so Kagoshima a prefecture where this distillery is situated, is actually not so far off from Hiroshima. So obviously you probably um, know what that city is famous for. Uh, it, that area was heavily damaged uh, during the war and parts of the distillery or parts of the uh, place where the, the distillery is placed now was quite heavily damaged and the alcohol that was there on site apparently was burning for a week after the bombing so yeah it's and it went up in smoke but they did rebuild it after the war i don't think it was the the, the same specific location but um it was the headquarters of the original Humbo company, and that's where they decided to uh, build a, another distillery for them. On top of that, they also have a aging facility in the Yakushima Island, which is just off the coast of the uh, southern tip of Japan. It's about 100 kilometers from, 100, 150 kilometers from uh, the, the Tsunuki distillery uh, by sea. Um, very tropical, it's a UNESCO heritage site since 92. Uh, beautiful lush forests, very humid. Like, I mean, the humidity, it's an average, I think, at 80 something percent, so very humid. The temperature never falls, be, be, usually don't fall below eight degrees Celsius a year. So it's anywhere between eight degrees to about 35. So very humid, very hot, very wet, very tropical. Um, and what they did was with this whiskey is they distilled it in, in, in uh, Shinshu. They put it into the uh, the tankers, 
went nearly 1,000 kilometers to the Yakushima Island to age it there and, and, um, and poured it into the barrels on site. I actually thought I, I asked this uh, question to Momoko. I was I was really curious. Is actually, did they uh, transport it barrels that were filled up already, or did they transport liquid? Because again, if you're traveling that big of a distance, uh, the effect of the shaking of the barrels uh, would probably have an effect on the agent as well. But he said that they they usually don't do that. Obviously, I would imagine why because you know, can I imagine trying to. Uh, load up a trailer full of barrels full of whiskey which are pretty heavy as it go as it goes along and then probably much more prone to leaks and uh, breakages and stuff like that so obviously that's a much safer option uh, so they are using uh, three types of barrels in this Pre not predominantly it's sherry uh, px and oloroso uh, the liquid is between three to four years old it is young but that doesn't mean that it feels young because of the tropical climate that's in Yakushima Island. Uh, they're able to achieve a, a quicker finish. Like the angel's share on the island is between eight to 10%, I think. So it's much, much higher than Shinshu. Shinshu is around three to four. Uh, Tsunuki is around five to seven, I think. And then Yakushima is eight to 10%. And what they do is every season they send about six thousand liters from each excuse me six thousand liters from each distillery and age it there. The aging facility is quite small; only can handle about four hundred casks at a time. So whiskey is coming out of this specific place where it was aged. is very rare. I think it was either eleven hundred bottles made or even less. Different sources say, say different things. So I'm not sure they could be talking about different markets. But they're they're saying around eight, eight, 1100 bottles were made. So even less than the than the Yakushima. And I think you can see the the effect of the tropical climate they had on this whiskey. Um, again it's cast strength so if you like to add a bit of water go ahead. Um, I think it opens up a little bit. Um, especially with the peat there is definitely a peat component in this uh but it's very faint when it's at cask strength um the guys at mars actually say that they they've uh, obviously ate some heavily peated uh distillates in yakushima but it seems that the tropical climate doesn't um uh, work well with uh, peated whiskies it seems that they, they say that a lot of that uh, peat evaporates very quickly mm -hmm. so even they have a very heavily peated whiskey it's not so very peated at the end of the maturation process so um they tend not to go with the heavier peated styles there they prefer to use the light peated and non-peated uh, for that agent facility in particular uh, they release this um every year they do like a single malt uh from Shinshu, aged at Yakushima. They started out in 2018, that was the first run. So that's the second run, I believe. Uh, yeah, that's the second run. And uh, they've released the uh, 2020 version. They are not so, well, last year. Uh, much lighter in color, much lower ABV. I think it was at 53, this is at 58. So um, I think the blending process was a little bit different as well. It was much lighter in color. It's a good two, three shades lighter. Uh, there is, Momoko said there was some uh, white American oak barrels used as well. So I, I'm guessing he's, he means uh, virgin barrels. Um, honestly, I can't really get that. A little bit, maybe. If you're fighting against Oloroso and you're fighting against Pedro yeah. Jimenez, it's, it's going to heighten something. It's going to yeah. be hard to pinpoint it in, a, in, a, in something that would be, say, virgin oak versus normal bourbon and a, a green. Or yeah, yeah. Yeah, so what do we think? Ooh. Much more peatier than I... It's kind of like charcoal off the barbecue, that kind of um, yes. smoky, almost salty. Yeah. Um, the we... saltiness could be from the aging climate, you know, mm. the, the closest to the sea. They're not that... The, the warehouse itself is not that far from the sea, so I'd imagine that... Like, there's a lot of fortified, fortified sweetness on it, but it's more like you're sweetening up the tobacco, you're sweetening up that kind of charcoal mm -hmm. than um, actually bringing in a ton of uh, dried fruits. But the aftertaste gets a lot sweeter. 
uh, it doesn't even dry out it just sweetens which is really strange yeah they, um, i'm used to kind of scotch doing the opposite irish doing the opposite where you're you're going from peat to sweet or sweet to peat and it's always ending on the peat this seems to end more sweetness of the peat or sweetness of charcoal. yeah it, it kind of leaves this a slight bitter note right at the the, the back of your mouth mm -hmm. like just just when it goes down but at the same time you have that sweetness on but the yeah side. the you're, sweetness yeah, is it, it, more fun away it, usually when you get that bitterness or you get that kind of dryness the sweetness is completely it seems like it's on. separated out yeah. like you're getting more of the sweetness closer to the, the front of your mouth and you get that uh, peated bitterness right like closer to the end um yeah it, it's, uh, it's it's very interesting once again it's um it's a very interesting blend uh, of casks i think mm -hmm. they they've they've played that like because i was really worried that you know you're talking tropical climate and you're putting fortified wine it's like oh jesus is going to be overdone completely like it's i know it's only three four years but yeah. it's also along yeah. the lines of the fortified wine survived the trip the whole way to that high climate and was still able to yeah. be used like i mean it's unbelievable like uh just this whiskey to arrive on this table and to your tables like it it, it traveled nearly 15 16 thousand kilometers from what i calculated out so it's like it went from Shinshu in the middle of Japan, down to this tropical island of the coast of Japan, back for bottling to Japan, and then shipped to France, where I got it from, and then shipped over to, to Ireland. And here we are today, like, I mean... And then you play with the fact that it's Oloroso, it's Pedro Jimenez, and then it's America, so the volume of distance the casks have to get just to get to... The that's point. It's a proper Mr. Worldwide whiskey, you know? Yeah. Um, the amount of uh, things that these components travel is, is beyond belief. And I, I love the fact that uh, Myers is playing on the, the fact that they have access to all those different uh, sites. And they have access to a lot of different things, actually. So the Yamanashi distillery that was firstly set up uh, by Myers, uh, when it stopped uh, whiskey production, they redeveloped it into a winery. So they still make wine there today, and it's still owned by Myers. So they not only they have access to all these amazing sites and amazing distilleries scattered across Japan, but they also have access to their own wine barrels and all different things like that. So it's it's, it's amazing that they they're able to kind of combine everything that they have within their their brand portfolio into into this bottle and using all the sites and all the uh, all the things they own completely to make this whiskey like it's uh, it's incredible the amount of uh places this this whiskey has traveled and i got here safe <laughs> <laughs> you amazing. know it's sometimes yeah uh, uh luckily enough it wasn't fast way that was delivering it so yeah it uh, it survived but yeah i got one of them last week <laughs> got a note through the door saying um uh delivered in garden looked in the front garden nothing there <laughs> about 13 14 feet from the side gate your man must have just just the la la <laughs> lamp it out yeah why not why not as long as it survives it survived oh it was packaged brilliantly good good well done Thank to whoever say uh, it uh, Irish malts. yeah they're fantastic for it ah, they're, they're very good in fairness I, 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 when you whenever you get delivered Irish malts it's, it's very hard to get it on package because it's always uh, packed very well so for play to them uh on that matter but yeah um this is yeah this this we're pretty much coming to an end we're going to the last one now and i have to say i had a, a huge dilemma yesterday where i was going to put this whiskey in and what what part of the lineup where which what was the the order of running and i that was the one i was struggling i pretty much had the all five that we tried already pretty much down very well and i wasn't too worried that they're going to clash with each other i think they worked very well but this one was just wasn't core operative at all. I don't know. It's it, it it's so different to all the other ones that um, yeah, it wasn't it, it wasn't uh, lining up with the rest. But anyway, Do you want to grab your friend? I'll grab my new friend. So mm. this is Kura, Kura the whiskey. And as I was said, I will talk about the new whiskey regulations that are coming in very soon. So April, no, sorry, uh, February thirteenth or February sixteenth. The JSLME, which is Japanese Spirits and Liqueur Makers Association. I said it right. Yeah, I think that's what that's the name. Could could be wrong. It, it's a, it's, a, it's a long uh, word. Anyway, uh, they've decided that the time has come to put in a new regulations for Japanese whiskey. 
and the new regulation stands as follows. So the grain doesn't have to come from Japan. They can be sourced from elsewhere, probably UK, because that's where they're getting it from at the moment. The fermentation, distillation, maturation has to happen in Japan. The maturation has to happen in a wooden barrel of no bigger size than 700 liters, I think. Mm -hmm. And it has to happen for minimum of three years to be able to call it a Japanese whiskey. So very similar to Irish uh, distillers. Uh, oh yeah, and uh, the, the spirit has to be distilled to no higher than 95% ABV. So 95 or below. Um, that's the regulations. They, they, they don't really specify on the types of grains that they use. Uh, or the yeast or anything like that, they believe in that kind open enough for um, for uh, speculation to different uh, parties involved. But yeah, they're they're more similar to our rules right now than they are to their rules that they had up until now. So as I was saying, in '89 they changed to call it whiskey Japanese whiskey. The component of the whiskey in the bottle had to be at at least 10% and it didn't have to be made in Japan at all. You could just buy some scotch, dilute it down with something and sell it as Japanese whiskey. Uh, obviously that's gonna change. Uh, on April 1st, those rules are coming into life and the existing brands on the portfolio of the companies, they have it up until 2024 to comply. They, they can they still have some some lead time to get rid of the old stock I suppose and then replace it with new stock but it's very promising I think it's the step in the right direction it was uh, I think it was a big damage to the category when you could not even have majority of the, the liquid in the bottle didn't have to even be whiskey you know um, and people could get away with it very easily um, on the other hand, though, there was another uh, association called the Japanese Whiskey Research Center that set up a different set of rules that maybe followed a little bit closer to what Japanese whiskey industry is right now or was up until now, that point. So the way that the research center wanted to set up the rules, they want to have three different categories uh, of uh, Japanese whiskey. So now have a Japanese whiskey, it pretty much followed the same rules that I mentioned earlier, with the one exception being that they didn't have to age the whiskey for three years, but they have to age the whiskey for a minimum of two years. And they argued that since Japanese climate is a little bit hotter and much different to the one in Scotland, obviously most parts, not all parts, as we learned earlier, and they argued that they don't need a three-year maturation, that two years was more than enough to carry out um, the maturation process. Uh, the second uh, category was to, supposed to be Japanese uh, new make. And that was basically following the same rules with the exception of having maturation under two years. And then on the other hand, uh, the third category we had what we called a Japan, a Japan made whiskey. So uh, adding component whiskey from elsewhere was a big part of the uh, Japanese whiskey industry since the start really. And it being a part of the heritage of using some outsourced whiskey from Scotland or other uh, places like Canada, uh, as well, was quite prevalent with uh, Seagram's being uh, one of the big players at, at one point as well in the whiskey industry in Japan. So uh, they did use some uh, Scotch and Canadian whiskies in their blends, and they wanted to make sure that this tradition uh, that shaped and molded Japanese whiskey industry was kept going, and they wanted to call it Japan made whiskey. So it had to follow all the same rules with the exception that not all whiskey had to be made in Japan, but some of the percentage of that whiskey had to be made by the Japanese whiskey standard, but, but uh, implementation of uh, outsourced blends was allowed. But as a customer, you'll be able to differentiate. You have a truly Japanese whiskey made in Japan and you have a Japanese whiskey, say blended and designed in Japan, but maybe does not have all the components that were made in Japan as such. But you're able to differentiate between the two, and you made if if you're you know educated enough in the subject, you'd be able to distinguish between the two. 
uh, both parties didn't agree on that, and uh, JSL and A decided to uh, don't go with Japan made whiskey. But the uh, uh, Whiskey Research Center, they set up a Tokyo spirit competition, and that was the rules that are meant to be implemented in 2020. But obviously, we know what happened in 2020, so uh, that competition didn't go ahead. But they're planning on going with these rules in 2021. So there is a bit of a disagreement at the moment. Now, these rules are not implemented by the government. They are implemented by an uh, internal organization. So it's not like the government is enforcing them. It's the the people that are in the association that are enforcing them upon themselves. So it's not a rule written down by the government. So I don't know if there are producers that are outside of the association. It'd be if very that's... similar to Scotland, Scotch Milk Whiskey Society would help with a lot of the rules by um, lobbying them. The Irish Whiskey Association and the Irish Whiskey Guild that's being formed, they would be places that the, the actual distillers, actual bonders, actual merchants getting together to set the guidelines and then the government or the food authorities or depending on which country it is, they would be the ones who'd implement it, but it would be them who designed it and then who kind of fight for it. Right. Um, so, on to the last one. So that's the Kura, and that probably represents the uncomfortable present. Like, the Suntory kind of were looking into the past. With Nika, you're looking into well, maybe the present situation. With Demaris, you're looking into the future of what, like, maybe the, 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 the smaller scale newcomers are, are making. And this is maybe a more uncomfortable past. I'm not saying this is a bad whiskey, whiskey by any means, but uh, the provenance and terroir of this whiskey is uh, a little bit questionable, to be to say the least. Now, I've emailed a couple of times Achilles, and uh, they unfortunately didn't give me any answers to find out uh, what's what. Um, well, anyway, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, Helios and Kura. So the distillery... Uh, is built on the island of Okinawa. Okinawa Island is very unique to Japan, uh, as it is like it's right bang on in between Taiwan and uh, Japan, with being a little bit closer to Japan uh, to Taiwan than Japan, but uh, it is still a Japanese island. Uh, the culture there is quite unique. They're a very unique group of people. The Okinawans uh, have like the higher the highest uh, uh, amount of centenaries in the world, I, I believe, because they're you know. Eat a very good diet and a very easy going lifestyle. Uh, but that wasn't the case uh, for all of its history. The islands were usually fought over by the Chinese and Japanese over its uh, history. And in during the Pacific War and World War II, it's seen some of the heaviest fighting. Uh, over a quarter of uh, Okinawan population was killed during the battle. Battle lasted 82 days and really heavy fighting, some extreme losses life and uh you know property and you know that it was it was uh, it was really a nasty conflict in the okinawan islands uh, during the war uh, when japan surrendered uh, okinawan islands are actually under a uh, government government of us so the us government was controlling the islands at the time and that stopped in 1971 when they officially given back the control over the islands to japan uh Still extremely heavy presence of the U.S. forces. They have huge amount of bases. And as far as I know, the locals are not very happy because they're taking so much of the of the land of the islands that, that, that they want to kind of them to scale down the operation, which they are slowly scaling down over, over the years. Uh, but yeah, it was a very conflicted kind of part of the, the uh, part of Japan after the war. But anyway, the distillery was built in 1961 and it was a rum distillery. It still is a rum distillery. And they decided to go with rum because they had so many Americans there and the tiki boom was life and well. And a lot of the GIs that are coming over to Okinawa are actually from Hawaii. And that's where kind of the tiki boom happened. So they all wanted rum. So they said, well, we have sugarcane here that's grown here quite nicely. And we had like we have the raw ingredients. Why not just start making the rum? So they that's what they did. Uh, uh, yeah, so they started in 71. They've developed a couple of products, white rum, aged rum, uh, spiced rum. Um, they also made some traditional uh, Japanese spirits like Awamori, soju. Awamori is actually uh, 
native to Okinawa. It's made from the specific grain, uh, specific rice type. So it's it's very uh, common to Okinawa Islands. And then in 1987, they wanted to they started whiskey distillation from what I found, uh, but that didn't last too long. They stopped in 2001. Uh, the reason they started whiskey distillation is because they wanted to get into uh, the Taiwanese market, which was quite close to them, uh, closer than Japan, and. They, that's that's the product they wanted to push. Uh, since they couldn't push uh, soju and awamori at the time in Taiwan because of the um, the, the ban essentially on uh, on these products, because uh, Taiwan wanted to uh, focus on the local industry, they didn't want to give more competition to uh, the local producers, so they didn't want these kind of spirits to come in. But they didn't have a problem with whiskey, so that's when they entered the whiskey market in '99. They released uh, Camilla, twelve-year-old. Apparently, it didn't really taste like whiskey. It tastes like more like an aged Awamori from the um, uh, reviews I was reading. Uh, some are good, some are bad. It's kind of right down in the middle. In 2001, they stopped distilling whiskey, and then in 2016, 16, they they apparently picked it back up. And they restarted the, the, the whiskey brand from Helios with Kura. They had three different types. They had the, the rum cask finish, sherry cask finish, and a regular classic. And they also had a brand called Reki. And that was all destined for the Taiwanese market. I think this one was as well. As there wasn't actually any whiskey going to Japan, even though it was made Japan, it was labeled as Japanese whiskey and all that. Reki. Uh, did have some of the whiskey that was produced by them from what I was able to find. Uh, not all of it was made by them. Some of it was caught with products outsourced from other places. This, on the other hand, is very likely nearly all completely scotch. So as you can see, this is, um, this is the, the, basically they got, they got the scotch over uh, from Scotland put it into their rum barrels, give it a, a quick finish, slapped on the bottle, and then just said distilled in Japan, uh, which actually says in the bottle. Um, distilled, yeah, distilled by Helios Distillery. So the provenance is, is questionable enough. Um, now, I'm not dogging them or anything like that, because like the, if, if you're able to do it and you're able, uh, that was the regulations, like why wouldn't you, you know, you have the option and Scotland makes really nice whiskey, so why wouldn't why wouldn't they you know use when they're when they're confident enough of their own product? Um, it's just as a consumer, you know, you think you're misled by that, but it really isn't their fault. Like it's just the regulations that they have. You know, they they will respect them if they're there, uh, but they're able to do that, and why wouldn't they? But anyway, let's get to the whiskey. So very heavy on the smoke, but I wouldn't even say it is a smoke. It's more like an ash, mm -hmm. like very fine, dusty white ash. Um, nothing that you would. Um... Comes across like a Killarn from um, Glen Goyle, just done a hundred percent in rum casks. There's that kind of um, rum sweetness to it. Yeah. As opposed to a finish. If that's a finish, then I don't actually know what kind of gas they would have first used. Because you can only take the only sweetness and the only non-smoke kind of flavors you can get from it seems to be that that rum. Mm -hmm. So if it is a three to four year old and the finish is six months to a year, maybe that is balancing out something that's a little bit light. Now saying that uh, again, the climate could play part. I would say yeah. it's more a little bit more tropical. So you know their six month finish or their three month finish could be quite substantial enough, so they are able to. Um, Pull it out much sooner. It, it, like I mean, smoke is heavy. Like well, the smoke, the, the kind of the ash mm -hmm. particle is very heavy, but that ho honeydew melon kind of note mm -hmm. is there. It's nice and sweet. It's, it's, it's the fact that they make their own rum. Like we would, we would turn around. is very nice as yeah. well. I like, heard yeah. stunning. Yeah. So if we were to if we were to take a, a wine cask, a sherry cask, a pork cask, right, and let that across to Ireland and still have it with the content contents in it. When you disgorge it, we call it a wet barrel. So yeah. The liquid's still in the wood. So um, when they turn around and say that this is rum finish, the rum could still be in the actual wood itself. So that could be somewhere between two and ten litres worth of rum. So by the time you go to say this is a finish and you've put the liquid into the cask, 
that could be drawn out. So that could be the reason why the rum impact is so big. You actually have rum technically in it. And as you were saying with the rules, they can mix it with whatever it is they want to. You could have the socio in here, You could, have, which would kind of make it that kind of green grassy aspect with yeah. the juicy yeah. wood, um, with rum. They could be cutting it with the actual rum itself, which again is what we would lean on. But again, they have stills. They have means of production. They have warehouses and all that. So, like, I mean, they are able to produce whiskey. It's just maybe they didn't have enough juice and they just wanted to kind of kickstart their their whiskey campaign and whiskey escapade. And, like, I mean, by any means, it's not not bad. It's just with the whole lineup, I, I was really struggling and trying to fit it in because I, like, initially I was going to put it first. But I thought that was the, the ash and the small component was very powerful and I didn't want to then that component leaching out into the rest so i decided to keep it at the end and um, like i mean it's it's a it's a pleasant drinker uh, i'd like to see it in a in a cocktail to be honest a penicillin mm -hmm. would be absolutely fantastic with it i think yeah and obviously rum finishes rum finished whiskeys usually work very nicely because they get that extra bit of sweetness um to the uh, to the whiskey itself and it does come across uh, out the cocktails very very nicely so have the tiny bit left maybe maybe later on what's the thing penicillins like uh when you're talking about isla whiskey it's very medicinal it's very salty mm -hmm. it's very iodine when you are using something along the lines of this where it is a peated whiskey so to speak but the peat's a lot more less in your face as a float yeah definitely yeah if you go for penicillin go for uh, Giovanni martinique rum or I do, yeah. yeah. I do. I have a San 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 James still from the last yeah. taste, and I still haven't drank it, so that will work well. With it. That uh, should work well. With it. So, yeah, that comes. That takes us to nearly the end of the tasting. Now we get on to the highball cocktail. Victoria is very happy that she doesn't have to listen to me shiting on about whiskey. Uh, I'd say most of you are exactly the same because I've been talking an awful lot and my voice is nearly gone. But anyway, I had so much information that I wanted to share with everyone because not everyone was um, um, maybe into the Japanese whiskey category. So I was trying to do my due diligence and give as much information about each of the as possible. On top of that, I also created this big document when I was doing my research. It's like 11,000 words. So I basically wrote a thesis. I put more work into this than I actually did to my thesis. So if anyone is interested in going more in depth into the information with relation to all the distilleries that uh, we've talked about, I can provide you that document. You can read it in your own time. Uh, also, if you want a little bit more of a read, where you have the book. Uh, this book is really helpful, Whiskey Horizon, uh, read by Stefan Van Eiken, and awesome book. Gives you a lot of information about the Japanese whiskey industry in general. So if you want a little bit more research, I can give you my notes. Or you can buy this book, uh, Book Depository, I think, has them. So you just taking it up on your story anyway, so they can follow up from there. Exactly. Hmm. Right. Okay. We move on to the cocktail. I'll grab my stuff. <sighs> yeah, here's something we did earlier. <laughs> right. That's all. You can ignore the noise in the background. Breaking everything that's around them, which is usual for bartenders. It's all well and good. So yeah, ice, glasses. Would you like me to make yours or would you like to make it yourself? No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I have the guest in your head. <laughs> no problem. No it's problem. all perfectly fine. Okay. So, oh, I need whiskey as well. That'd be helpful. So Thank you very necessity. much. I'll keep it this way. So, highball. I'm going to do a lot more history again. Sorry. <laughs> this is basically what restarted the Japanese whiskey industry. This cocktail essentially made Japanese whiskey resurface once again very successfully. So what they did was Suntory launched a big, massive advertisement campaign with the help of a lot of very famous people in Japan. So um, they did a lot of advertisements and you know, like banners and stuff like that. Uh, in 2000 and early 2000s, moving on to 2008, they did a bigger campaign and um, 
they focused on trying to uh, get into the beer market so trying to call into the beer market as much as they wanted to produce a drink that obviously had whiskey in it but uh, it was still easy to drink refreshing and you know um easy going so they came up with a with the classic highball highballs were very popular in the the 60s and the 70s also before the the, the whiskey ice age what they call it in japan uh so it, it wasn't like a new thing discovered. It, it was prevalent up until the 80s in Japan. And then uh, people moved on to white spirits after after that. Um, but they decided uh, to try try to take a stab at it again. And successful is probably the wrong way of saying it. They were unbelievable at what they done with this campaign. In 2008, they launched it, right? And they were selling pre-made highballs and in, in cans, like you know, you get your with your whiskey ginger. Think of highball as a as a Japanese equivalent of whiskey and ginger in here. So they were making highballs and cans ready mixed, uh, and they were in 2008 they sold 38,000 cases, so 24 in a case, 250 ml a can. In 2009 they sold 6.2 million, one year. One year of of, uh, of advertisement, and it went from zero to this unbelievable number. It like it was crazy, and that's what kickstarted off the shortages essentially. Because even if they high low grade whiskey, they're you know they were like no not low grade. I, I shouldn't say that, but uh, younger uh, whiskey. They're using that into their Kakobin blend, for example, or their Nika Black as it would be the equivalent of the Kakobin for Nika. And they were using that to make um, make the highballs and like successful. It's the un uh, like the underestimation of of biggest sort. Um, they are very particular how they make the highballs. Uh, in Izakayas, they're very simple, just you know thrown in together in a nice kind of uh, beer mug class kind of uh, glass. Um, but you can go to those high end bars where they you know they make it very. The, the the whole story behind um, making it is is very particular. So I'm going to try my best to emanate that kind of very fine Japanese way of making highballs. Like it's very particular on what they're making. Uh, please uh, don't bother with what I'm doing because like I went completely over the top. I I want to show you uh, how much effort the Japanese um, put into their highballs. How much. Uh, uh, pride and energy and, and art goes into making a highball like that in you know, one of those high-end bars. Uh, the cheap ones, obviously, you know, they're nice. They're just thrown together like you would with Jamie and Ginger, but uh, the ones that are high-end that you get in those high-end uh, cocktail bars, they're made to the highest standard. So in Japan, the biggest thing is the ice, the clear ice, the dead, the dead clear ice, or whatever you want to call it. So I made some of my own. Um, I think I did a pretty good job. It's a bit frosted over right now, but obviously that's going to change when we pour whiskey over it. But yeah, um, see how it goes. So they're very specific in how they're making the the highball. So they want three three big three big ice cubes added into the glass. So that's one. If I can grab it, <laughs> maybe not. We will also note that okay. Japanese bartenders don't usually have six whiskeys before they want to move ice. Yeah, usually. So <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm just gonna use my hands. I'm not gonna bother with this. Chris, you don't mind. I wash my hands. Yeah. You you're okay with that. I know it's not very hygienic, COVID and all that crack, you know, but look, it is what it is. Um, okay. Okay, we have two because I can't fit anymore. But anyway, uh then they stir they stir the glass down to make sure that everything is nicely chilled. Now, I've put these glasses in the freezer before, so I probably don't need to overdo it too much because of that. This one probably won't move too much. Anyway, okay. So, in your packs, you have a 50 ml of whiskey uh, of the Nika Days. And you have 125 ml of soda. So uh, usually the ratio is three to one. So uh, I basically give you 50. You can use 50, but you can use 40 instead. And that will be perfect size for the, the size of the soda water that you're using. So 
Uh, use 40 and then you can have a little bit to taste of the Nika days as well. So if you want to do that, go ahead. If you don't, uh, you can leave it as it is. But anyway, so we had 40 mils of our Nika. Now you can see the clear ice nicely. Yep. Now with the Nika days, you have between a three and six year old um, blend. So it's grain and one, two, three different types of malt. Uh, you have your American white oak, you have your bourbon barrels, and they could have two or three other types of barrels. They're the ones that they state on the internet. Yeah. Um, with this, the, like with the previous whiskeys that we've tried, it's all about the blending out in itself. Um, it actually does give across for a young whiskey uh, a lot of different flavors. Uh, so yeah, um, when you pour your whiskey over, you are meant to stir it 13 and a half times to make sure that there's enough dilution and that there is uh, enough chilling happening also. So I did one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen and a half. So the 13 and a half spins, very particular. There we go. So then we pour over all of our soda over the top. As usual, there's no need for bar blades. No. <laughs> Teeth, anything will do at the side of the counter. And then you are meant to stir it three and a half times again. One, two, three and a half. And then slightly raise the cubes to make sure that everything is mixed. Stick a straw. And there you go. Chris, you get the first one. Thank you very much. No problem. I'm just gonna finish my one. I started already. I'm gonna pour my soda. So the carbonization of the soda water does majority of the work for you. The whole point of the 13 and a half and three and a half is the contact of ice with all the glass and the contact of ice with all the liquid is mainly to chill it down. So once it's at the right temperature worth of liquid, then that's when you're supposed to enjoy it the most. Now, uh, different variations also on this uh, drink. Uh, uh, there's a variation called the Samboa, which is, there's no ice, everything is chilled. So chilled whiskey, chilled glass, chilled soda, um, and then uh, a lime twist added to it. Uh, this is more of a classic uh, way of looking at it. Uh, they do like to add a lemon wedge or a lemon wedge or a lemon peel as well to it, but uh, the classic one is without it. Sometimes they also add mint sprig also, but uh, that's more of a, a classic way of doing it. If you ever visit those uh, big bars in Japan, that's the way they make it maybe you know a bit more fancier and you know they're dressed up a little nicer and all that but yeah that's the, the main general idea of it and i was kind of blown away how simple and easy it is to drink and i really do understand how uh, it really speaks to uh, japanese consumers because they do like uh, drinks that are lighter they, they water down their whiskey um, and that's how they enjoy it and I think that just suits them down to the ground and I, I think it's a perfect combination. Nika Days in itself was named Days is because it's a good daily drinker they say, either enjoyed neat or um, on its own, but I think in the highball it works uh, extremely well. But yeah, um, I think that's the end, at last, you survived. Fair play to you, because I mean, I wasn't sure if you're all going to be here for that long, because they, I, I tend to talk quite a lot, as you can see. Um, but yeah, I really, really enjoyed um, being a part of this taste, and I hope you did too. Um, there'll be more coming on the way, both from myself and from Chris in the near future. Chris, do you have something coming up now that you Plenty. can share? Always. Yeah. None to share. Now the two of us will be uh, talking cast strength in the next couple of weeks and talking world whiskey in the next couple of weeks, but uh, we'll leave it at that. Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm going to actually go ahead with uh, world whiskey, which is right behind me if uh, any of you good hawk uh people spotted it. So 
all this and this and this is going to be tasted in our next whiskey tasting, which is all about world whiskey. And we are going to taste seven different whiskeys from seven different countries. So if you think you are interested, give me a shout. And I'm going to stick you on the list if you're nice. Um, I hope you enjoyed taking part of your busy schedules, I'd say, on a Friday evening and enjoying me blabbering on about Japanese whiskey that I probably have no clue what I'm talking about. But I think I've did a pretty decent job. Well, if not, you. just let me know. <laughs> you made it the whole way to the end of the notes, so I'm very impressed. Yeah, no, um, I barely looked at them. I was trying to yep. hold on to the dates, but at the end, uh, it was pointless. Um, so yeah, listen, once again, thank you very much for listening, and I hope you all enjoyed your time with us this Friday evening. And stay tuned, make sure you follow us, and uh, there'll be more coming your way. See you guys. <laughs> You've been warned. <laughs> Cheers. Oh, cheers. <laughs>